current was getting over to the magnet, the magnetism ceases, and the gong stick, being no longer attracted, falls back again against the pillar, whereupon the current once more gets across to the magnet. The gong stick makes another stroke, falls back again, and so on, continuing to tremble between the pillar and the magnet as long as the button of the push is held in. These bells are the ones in common use and are called trembler bells. The ordinary push consists merely of two pieces of brass spring-mounted in a wooden or metal case. The wire from the battery to the bell is cut at the place where the push is to be fixed, and the two wire ends are fastened to the two brass pieces, which are normally standing clear of each other, but which are pushed together by the little ivory button, completing the circuit, which is again broken when the button is released. Before electric bells came into use, it was customary to fit up in the servants' quarters in a house quite an array of swinging bells, each of which had a different tone, and the maids were supposed to know which room was indicated by the particular sound of the bell. We all have some experience of the inadequacy of such a system through the failure of a servant to understand the language of the bells. It is possible now, with the aid of an electrical indicator or enunciator, to use only one bell for several hundreds of rooms in a large hotel. The wire from each push passes round a separate little electromagnet, and then to the one bell, so that the current will magnetize this special electromagnet as well as ring the bell. This small magnet may be made to attract a little lever and allow the flap or shutter of an indicator to fall, leaving the number of the room exposed, or it may be made to set a small pendulum swinging, on the bob of which is carried a brightly colored disc, placed immediately over its particular number, and so on. It may also be arranged that the bell continues to ring until the attendant stops it. These continuous ringing bells are now used for many purposes, and are such that, when the gong stick moves forward under the first impulse, a small spring which was resting on the gong stick falls down against a contact piece and closes the circuit from the battery direct to the bell, so that when the bell has once been set in motion from the distant push, it will continue ringing until this little spring is lifted off the contact piece and again held up by the gong stick. The value of such an arrangement will be appreciated in connection with a fire alarm as it commands attention. Anyone requiring to rise early in the mornings and finding the ordinary alarm clock insufficient may remove the gong from the clock and cause the little gong stick to set in motion one of these continuous ringing bells, which will certainly give him no peace till the unwilling victim rises and replaces the contact spring. Many years ago, and before the introduction of these continuous ringing bells, I made up a reliable alarm in the following fashion. Fixing an ordinary trembler bell on the outside of a battery box, I placed a brass hinge on the top of the box, screwing down the one half of the hinge and leaving the other free to be lifted or let down on the box lid at pleasure. Underneath this movable end of the hinge, I placed a little metal plate, or contact piece, fixing one wire from the battery to this, so that the current could only get to the hinge when it was in contact, and thence by a wire attached to the fixed half of hinge to the bell. Having removed the gong from an ordinary cheap alarm clock, I placed on the top of the clock and lying against the gong stick a round piece of metal which was attached by a string to the free end of the hinge, normally standing up away from the contact piece. When the alarm of the clock goes off, the gong stick kicks the metal piece off the top of the clock, and in falling it pulls the desk hinge down onto the contact piece, completing the circuit, setting the electric bell in operation, so that the would-be sleeper must bestir himself to rise and lift the hinge off the little metal plate. The apparatus is very simple and I used such an alarm for many years without finding it to fail me once, and having given several young engineers duplicates of it, I have received from them the same report. I remember one young engineer who arranged his alarm clock so that as soon as it commenced to ring it also began to walk along the mantel shelf, so that he had to make haste and check its suicidal intentions. Another young man, who desired to have as long in bed as possible, arranged his clock to make a preliminary and somewhat feeble alarm, but at the same time to turn on the gaslight under a small kettle arrangement, and when the water boiled, the enclosed steam blew a whistle placed on the tightly fitting lid, thus informing its master that everything was now in readiness. We now have automatic fire alarms, whereby the excessive heat of any place catching fire will close an electric circuit and give the alarm direct to the fire brigade. 
A simple arrangement by which heat may be made to close a circuit is a piece of curved spring made up of two flat pieces of different metals which expand at different rates. And being clamped to each other at both ends, the curved spring uncurls till it comes against a metal contact, thus completing an electric circuit, just as one does in pressing the button of a bell push. There are many other devices, but this one will serve as an illustration of how an alarm of fire may be automatically given. This device, which is called a thermostat, may be arranged to give an alarm if the temperature of a greenhouse rises too high or falls too low by placing the free end of the metal curve between two contact pieces so that if it either curls or uncurls a certain amount, it will come in contact with one or other of these metal stops and complete the circuit. I have seen the temperature of a room automatically kept constant by such an arrangement. Gas stoves were placed here and there around the room, and each stove was under control of a thermostat, as just described. When the temperature began to rise, the thermostat, instead of causing a bell to ring, operated an electromagnetic device which lowered the gas, or if the temperature rose sufficiently, turned the gas off altogether, leaving only a small pilot jet burning, similar to the bypass of an incandescent gas burner. When the temperature came down again, the metallic curve leaving the contact piece allowed the electromagnetic device to turn the gas on again. The room was kept by this means always at a constant temperature, never being more than half a degree above or below the desired heat. When electric heating can be obtained at a marketable price, I have no doubt that it will be a common practice to have the temperature of our houses and offices automatically controlled. What a boon it will be to the household to dispense with troublesome fireplaces. If it is desired to know exactly when some liquid reaches a definite temperature, it is an easy matter to make up an ordinary mercury thermometer for the purpose. The wire from the battery is passed through the glass bulb so that it is in contact with the mercury, while another wire enters the long stem at the place where the specified temperature is marked off, so that as soon as the mercury rises to this point, the current will find a passage through the mercury from the wire in the bulb up the stem to the other wire and thence to the alarm bell. Electricity is called in as a detective to prevent burglars entering a house unnoticed. The opening of a window or a door completes a circuit, and a bell rings in the master's room. In America, where burglar alarms are more common than in this country, houses are sometimes connected up to the nearest police station, so that an alarm may be given if the house is tampered with while it is unoccupied. I remember hearing of a burglar who detected one of these wires which led to the police station, and correctly guessing what it was, the burglar took the precaution to cut the line of communication between the window and the police office before attempting to force an entrance. No doubt he would congratulate himself upon his foresight, and possibly he may have been a little more deliberate about his work than he would otherwise have been, for while he was still busy opening the window, he found himself in the clutches of the law. The secret of the surprise was that the wire leading away to the local police office was carrying a very weak current, which kept a magnetic needle at the police office, deflected to one side. If a window or door was opened, the wire was broken thereby, and with the stoppage of the current, the little magnet at the police station was no longer deflected, and on reaching its normal position, it made a contact and set an alarm bell going. So in the above case, the burglar sent the alarm by cutting the wire before he attempted to open the window. The application of these burglar alarms has been so developed that the intruder may be photographed while tampering with a safe. A very clever capture was made some years ago in America by an electrical alarm which set off a flashlight and pulled the trigger of a camera directed to take a view of the front of the safe. In this way, the burglar was unconsciously photographed and was easily recognized by the police authorities. There is an almost endless variety of uses to which electricity may be adapted for giving alarms and signals of one kind or another, but the one particular application which stands out preeminently is that of signaling between railway signal cabins. Our present complicated railway traffic would be quite impossible but for the aid of electricity. Doubtless, everyone knows something of the block system of railway working, but as there often seems to be an unnecessary mystery as to what this really means, it will be well to explain the principle. The railway is divided into sections, or blocks, there being a signaled cabin at the entrance and the exit of each block, so that one signal cabin controls the exit from one block and the entrance to the next. 
to take the simplest case of a cabin, which is merely a passing place and not a junction, and having only one up and one down track to control. In addition to his ordinary telegraph instruments and signaling bells, by which the signalman can communicate with the cabin on either side of him, he has a special needle instrument for indicating whether there is a train in his section or not. It will be remembered that in a needle telegraph the little magnet, being pivoted at its center, remains vertical or upright when at rest, but if a current is sent through the coil in one direction the magnet will be deflected to the right, while a current sent in at the opposite end of the coil will deflect the needle to the left, so that the needle has three distinct positions, upright, slanting to the right, and slanting to the left, any of which it may be made to take up at will and remain there as long as the current is left on. The dial of the indicating telegraph is marked off so that when the needle is standing upright it points to the words line blocked, which signifies that the semaphore signals are set at danger, but that there is no train on the section between the cabins. When the needle is deflected to the right, it points to the words line clear, which informs the signal man that the section has been prepared to receive a train, the outdoor semaphore signals having been lowered. Slanting to the left, the needle points to the words train on line, meaning that a train is actually passing between the cabins. This special telegraph instrument we will call the block instrument. The working of these signals may be simply illustrated by supposing that we are in the central cabin, number two, having number one to our right and number three to our left. A train is on its way from number one to number two, so number two telegraphs to number three, asking him in code if his line is clear. This he does on his ordinary telegraph apparatus. If the train may proceed, number three answers in code that the line is clear, and he also puts his block instrument to line clear, which at the same time makes number two's block instrument point to the same words. The needles remain in this position so that number three cannot forget that he has given permission for a train to come on, and number two, looking at his indicator, has confidence in sending on the train, and he can therefore set his outdoor signals to the clear position, the semaphore signal being analogous to a policeman who holds out his arm to stop the traffic, and drops it to his side to let the driver know he may pass. The engine driver must not dare to go past the policeman signal when the arm is up. When the train is entering number three section from number two, the latter signalman must telegraph to number three, saying, train entering section, and number three must acknowledge it and change the block instrument in his own and number two's cabin to train on line, where it will remain as a constant reminder to both men that there is a train in their section. When the train has passed number three and gone into the fourth section, number three advises number two by telegraph train out of section and also moves their block instruments to line blocked. There are many varieties of block signaling instruments, but the one just described will serve to illustrate the principle. I have often found people giving an entirely wrong meaning to the block system, believing that it is impossible for a signalman to allow a train to pass when the line is not clear because of some connection between the outdoor signals or the train itself and the telegraph apparatus but in the ordinary block system in general use, there is no such connection. The conditions of working are just such as have been briefly indicated here, in which the block telegraph may be regarded merely as a safeguard in making the instructions from one signal cabin to the next quite clear and permanent till the duties have been performed, but it is a possibility for the man at number three to signal train out of section to number two before the train has really passed, and in the same way it is possible, though fortunately not very probable, that number two may send on a train without getting permission to do so. The block system does not relieve the signalman of his responsibilities and reduce him to a mere automaton, as some people are inclined to think. But its great advantage is that the needle keeps pointing to the instructions until they have been made use of. There is a method called the lock and block system in which the outdoor mechanical signals are really connected to the circuit controlling the block telegraph so that when line clear is signaled, the telegraph is locked in that position until the train, when passing the outdoor signal, depresses a lever thus releasing the semaphore arm, which in turn operates the block telegraph. This system, however, is not in general use. 
If the signalman's duties were merely routine work, this lock-and-block system might come into more general use, but as his duties are such that he cannot be merely an unthinking automaton, he is provided with a key by which he can disconnect this lock-and-block arrangement and act as necessity requires, and in this there may be possible confusion. Apart altogether from these block systems, there is an interlocking at junctions between the semaphore signal and the railway points so that the signalman cannot lower his signal until he has moved the points, and he cannot put the points back again until he has put the signal to danger. But this is merely a mechanical arrangement. The signalman usually supplies the energy required to move the outdoor signals and points, these being connected with pulling wires and moving levers, but there are now some places equipped with small electro-motors to supply the necessary movements. End of Chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Romance of Modern Electricity This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson Chapter 13 Further Applications of Electricity An immense lift for an electromagnet. Electricity gives gas a helping hand. Electricity on board a man-of-war. A note on Guy Fox. Blasting on a grand scale. Torpedoes. Recording the velocity of projectiles. Electric clocks. An electric log. Paradoxes of electricity. Electrocution. Quick news of the Battle of Tel El Kabir. The untrustworthy telephone. Can fogs be dispelled? In steel and ironworks, Large electromagnets have recently been brought into use for lifting heavy metal plates and so forth. Instead of fixing a chain and hooks around the plate, the crane merely carries a large electromagnet at the end of its wire rope or chain, and this magnet attracts the plate and holds onto it as long as the current is kept switched on to the magnet. In the accompanying illustration, a large magnet is shown lifting a heavy metal casting weighing about three tons and on the same page may be seen an ordinary kitchen poker lifting scissors and keys which serves to show the principle electricity and gas are strong rivals as illuminants but we sometimes find electricity giving gas a helping hand when a large chandelier is out of easy reach and cannot be conveniently lighted by a taper it is only necessary to arrange a short gap for an electric current to spark across and to arrange that when the gas is turned on, the electric current is also momentarily switched on, and the gas thus ignited by the spark. This simple but useful application dates back to 1839, at which time few practical applications of electricity had been made. Indeed, I was rather surprised the other day, on picking up a science book published in London in 1840, to find the following statement. Quote, it must be allowed that the case has not been the same with electricity as with magnetism. The latter, by the invention of the magnetic needle, has served to render navigation more secure, and to discover the new world, a source of new riches, new wants, and of new evils to the old one. But electricity has not yet produced anything of so much importance to mankind and to the arts if we accept the analogy now proved between the electric fire and lightning, an analogy which has given rise to a pretty sure preservative from the effects of that dreadful meteor. For, in regard to the cures effected by electricity, it must be acknowledged that they are either rare or not well ascertained. End quote. What benefits we have reaped from the applications of electricity during the years that have passed since the above lines were first penned. A steamer, equipped with a powerful electric searchlight, is at a great advantage in many ways. We may take as an illustration an incident which happened some years ago on a British man-of-war, and may have been repeated often since the occasion referred to. The ship was steaming along on a very dark night, when the cry was raised of, "'Man overboard!' 
it is not difficult to realize the horror of those on board when thinking of the speed the vessel was making and the dense blackness of the night how many sailors are lost every year even from slow-going vessels because it is impossible to find the whereabouts of the lost man in the darkness in the case of this british warship two of her officers happened to see the sailor fall off the rigging and both immediately dived into the water to the poor man's rescue the great searchlight at once scanned the water and soon revealed the three men clinging to a life buoy the searchlight kept them in view while the steamer slowed down and swung round so that the lifeboat was able to go straight to the men in the water and it was reported that within six minutes the men were saved the lifeboat hoisted and the great ship once more on her way in time of war electricity now plays a very prominent part not only as a carrier of intelligence but as a prompt and sure assistant in the firing of guns and the exploding of distant mines it is even made possible for the captain of a large warship to fire a whole broadside simultaneously the commanding officer being able to see from instruments in his conning tower when all the guns are set and ready not only may submarine mines be exploded electrically by making a small platinum wire red hot but much the same may be done on land during the russo-japanese war we saw what a terrible disaster may be brought about by the enemy undermining a whole roadway and then by electrical means firing the mine from any distance at the moment their opponents have reached the prepared spot and in this heartless fashion practically annihilating a whole regiment it is very well that guy fawkes was born too early to obtain assistance from electricity in the firing of explosives or he and his friends might have succeeded in evading suspicion in connection with the vault they rented under the house of lords having once secreted the thirty-six barrels of gunpowder unnoticed they could have left the store closed knowing that they would be able to fire the explosives from their adjoining house at the moment when parliament had assembled even the anonymous and vague letter of warning might have failed for it was only when the lord chamberlain saw this very tall and desperate fellow in charge of the vaults that his suspicions were really aroused electricity has made it possible to fire very large blasts for clearing away rocks and so forth to form an adequate conception of the application of electricity it is worth while picturing the great blasting operations which took place some twenty years ago in america in the destruction of flood rock in the east river near new york about nine acres of solid rock were undermined and honeycombed and over thirteen hundred holes were drilled in which were placed the explosives each dynamite cartridge was provided with an electric fuse and a wire was run out and connected to a number of fuses in one particular section and then back to the controlling station again each section being arranged in this way then the ends of the leading out wires were all brought together and placed in a vessel of mercury while the ends of all the leading in wires were placed in a second vessel of mercury it only remained now to take a powerful battery and place one wire in the mercury at the leading out ends and the other wire in the mercury at the leading in ends thus completing the circuit and allowing the current to fly out to all these fuses in the dynamite cartridges causing the simultaneous explosion of over three hundred thousand pounds weight of dynamite and so forth and blowing up many thousands of tons of solid rock the ordinary torpedo of naval warfare is purely mechanical and has no connection with electricity but is propelled by compressed air furnishing the necessary power to its engines for harbor defense work electricity has been called into the service of the torpedo as in the sims edison torpedo in which the power is conveyed by means of electricity from a dynamo on land or on board a ship but the disadvantage is a long trailing cable connecting the dynamo with small electromotors in the torpedo it has been suggested to control the steering gear of torpedoes by means of ether waves as used in wireless telegraphy this has been found quite possible and several patents have been taken out in this connection 
be it noted that the ether waves do not convey the propelling power as some writers have set forth but merely operate upon a coherer as in a wireless telegraph receiver switching off and on the local power to the differential gear controlling the steering apparatus electricity enables us to measure the speed at which projectiles are flying an electrical contact may be placed at any point in the path of a projectile so that the exact fraction of a second at which it passed this point may be recorded on a chronograph as will be described in connection with electricity in the observatory a second contact maker placed at any given distance will note the time at which the projectile passes it and in this way the time taken to travel from one point to the other has been recorded it is even possible to place two contacts at different parts in the bore of a gun and thus find the velocity of the projectile before it leaves the mouth of the projector and the time noted may be correctly measured to one five hundredth part of a second electricity now aids in the measuring of time for everyday requirements either in controlling the clock or in propelling it in the former the swing of the pendulum is merely hastened or retarded by an electric impulse sent out every second by a standard clock inside which a magnet swings attached to the bob of the pendulum in the latest form of electrically driven clocks there is merely a dial with an electromagnet and lever operating a toothed or ratchet wheel moving forward the minute hand of the clock one step at each half minute the hour hand being geared to this in the ordinary way an electric impulse is received by the electromagnet at every half minute through a large standard clock which closes a circuit once every thirty seconds it does seem rather ridiculous that we should be content to have in every city a multitude of little pieces of somewhat complicated mechanism each little item trying to do exactly the same as its neighbor and each requiring individual attention supplying it with a store of energy once daily or weekly while some skill is required to specially regulate each individual clock why not have one standard clock for every city checked by the local or nearest observatory and closing at the end of each half minute an electric contact allowing current to pass out to all the dials and thus move their respective hands forward one half minute it is even possible to have such dials fitted with a wireless coherer to catch ether waves and switch off and on a local battery in the clock to operate its hands i fear that any public clocks of this kind might pick up wireless telegraph messages and become rather eccentric in their behavior one could imagine a clock coming within the influence of waves intended for a wireless station and if the message was a lengthy one the public on consulting the wireless clock would think the time was literally flying here again these ether waves do not drive the clock but merely control the driving power in the clock the uses to which the transmission of power by electricity may be put are legion for instance one may place the various parts of a large organ in any desired positions in a large hall or cathedral keeping the echo organ at quite a distance from the other parts while the keyboard may be put in any convenient place in depressing the organ keys the organist merely makes electrical contacts thus allowing current to pass to the different electromagnets opening the pipes electric pianos have also been constructed so that a pianist might perform from any distance but this does not lend itself to any very practical use more especially as we now have so many clever automatic pianolas and so forth on board ship the log may be taken by electricity the electric log consists of a fly or screw which is trailed after the ship and revolves in proportion to the speed at which the ship is travelling this revolving screw is arranged to make an electric contact thus working an indicator or making a pen move over a revolving drum after the fashion of the wind velocity instruments to be described in the chapter on electricity in the observatory a rather curious application of electricity is to be found in the hairdresser's establishment he makes use of electricity either to destroy the roots of superfluous hairs or to stimulate the growth of the hair 
this may seem rather paradoxical but what works in greater contrasts than electricity it sounds an alarm at the outburst of fire and thus protects from danger both lives and property but it also most deathly fires the submarine mine and sends a whole crew to the bottom of the ocean sinking along with them a man-of-war costing perhaps a million golden sovereigns again in the hands of the physicians it will cure and save life but in the hands of the executioner it will injure and kill this last-mentioned application of electricity which is now the method of executing the death penalty in the united states has doubtless been somewhat unsatisfactory owing to a restriction that the current used must not distort or disfigure the body of the criminal in some cases death has not been instantaneous whereas but for the restriction just mentioned it could easily have been made absolutely sure that death would ensue before the nerves could communicate any sense of pain to the brain given a free hand an electrocution would be the most humane method what if the lifeless body were disfigured or even totally cremated by the electric current surely this would be infinitely better than our present barbarous method of carrying out the death penalty in these islands let us pass from this depressing subject to that of warfare war must appear to all thinking people as a barbarous relic of the past entailing the destruction of thousands of innocent lives over some national quarrel based it may be on some misunderstanding but even in warfare we may find electricity performing many peaceful as well as destructive acts all modern armies have their own telegraph experts and it was found possible during the british operations in egypt in eighteen eighty two to keep the advance guard not only in constant communication with the headquarters but with great britain itself by this means the news of the victory of tel el kabir was telegraphed from the battlefield to the late queen victoria and her congratulations were received in reply within three-quarters of an hour after the victory was won if any one had spoken of sending photographs by telegraph a few years ago we should have thought the suggestion was made merely as a jest it is impossible to send the actual photographs along the wire but reproductions are made at the distant place the photograph at the sending end is transparent and controls a beam of light passing through it the varying light affects a selenium cell causing it to alter its resistance to an electric current passing through it the resulting current passes out to the distant station where it controls another beam or pencil of light which builds up a reproduction of the transmitting photograph full details are given in the romance of modern photography before closing this chapter which does not attempt to include all the applications of electricity i should like to mention two more i have repeatedly read that the microphone which is simply a sensitive telephone is used by medical men as a delicate stethoscope but from experiments i made in this connection many years ago on behalf of some medical men i found that the sounds set up by every slight variation of the current in the microphone were a great disadvantage even a very clever mechanical stethoscope made on the continent while magnifying the sounds greatly so that one can hear a friend's heartbeat like a sledgehammer even through his overcoat has not i believe proved a practical success for distinguishing the different internal sounds it might serve as a quick means of discovering if there was any heartbeat in the case of an apparent death i have seen it used for this purpose but from inquiries i do not find that it has come into any general use this mechanical stethoscope is much simpler than an electric one would be so that there does not seem a reliable foundation for these repeated reports regarding them i think the case is very similar to one i had knowledge of some years ago i had made up an electrical device by which the cries of an infant in its cot would automatically ring an electric bell in the servants quarters i found it possible but not a practical apparatus to be left in the hands of domestic servants and so i altered it to a loud-speaking telephone by which the cries could be heard at any distance having written a description of this suggested automatic alarm 
for one of the electrical journals. I was rather surprised when, two years later, a friend drew my attention to a description of it in a popular magazine, wherein it was stated that the apparatus was in everyday use in America, which I knew was not the case. Possibly the article was copied in some American journal, from which it found its way again, in a slightly altered form, to a monthly magazine on this side, and on its way the misunderstanding had arisen. Another application of electricity has reference to the deposition of smoke and fog. It has long been well known that a hot body will repel dust particles in the air, while a cold body will attract them. This is easily proved by a very simple experiment. If a globe of hot water and a globe of cold water be placed under a glass cover and some magnesium ribbon be burned inside the cover, it will be seen that the dust particles all gather on the cold globe while the heated one remains dust-free. It was found that if a platinum wire were heated by an electric current in the smoky air of a glass jar, the air became clear and the dust was quickly deposited on the inner surface of the jar. It was proved later that the same effect could be produced by electrifying the air, for a high-potential electrical discharge inside the jar soon cleared the air of dust. This has found a practical application in depositing the harmful fumes in lead works. As a dust-laden atmosphere is necessary for the formation of fogs, mists, clouds, or rain, it is evident that by electrifying the air and depositing the dust we should clear the atmosphere of fog. To do so in a wholesale fashion would doubtless cost a ransom, but Sir Oliver Lodge suggests that this might be done at important centres where the fog is most dangerous. While the principal of Birmingham University suggests this method, he does not believe it to be the right remedy any more than free meals and free doles are a sound remedy for the problem of poverty. But in the absence of a better remedy, it is worth a trial. Electricity has been applied in agriculture also. The origin of this latest plan is of interest. Professor Lemstorm of Sweden was making some electrical experiments to imitate the aurora borealis. He made these in his greenhouse, and he observed that the plants in the neighborhood of his apparatus seemed to thrive exceptionally well. This led him to try the effect of similar high-tension discharges upon fields of growing grain. The necessary current is now obtained by means of a dynamo and induction coil, and the discharge is made from a network of wires erected over the field. The appearance is that of several rows of telegraph poles, there being about one hundred yards between each row. The wires on these carry the main charge, while finer wires connect the parallel wires together every twelve yards. Wheat grown under electric discharges has yielded an increase of thirty and forty percent more than that from part of the same field unelectrified. The wires may be placed about fifteen feet above the ground, and the poles are so far apart that there is no difficulty in carrying on the ordinary work of the field. The cost of supplying the necessary current, apart from the first cost of the installation, is very small. It, practically, means the cost of running a small oil engine or other motor for driving the dynamo. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Romance of Modern Electricity This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson Chapter 14 Electricity and Speech What Speech Is Really? How Electricity Produces Sound Useful Invention by a Clergyman how telephone exchanges are worked, some amusing ideas, central battery system, clever signaling apparatus, the howler, who keeps a note of subscribers' calls. Some people are content to go through life without ever stopping to think how it is that we can produce speech. The whole subject of sound, which branch of science is called acoustics, is a most interesting one to everyone who cares to study it. 
it is known to all that when a body produces or emits a sound such a body must be in vibration in order to disturb the surrounding air and set up similar vibrations in it which in turn strike upon the drums of our ears and cause certain sensations to be conveyed by our auditory nerves to the sensorium the setting up of such air vibrations is very apparent in the beating of the big drum the clapping of cymbals the striking of a piano key the bowing of a violin string and so forth again we have the vibrating reeds in many wind instruments and in others such as flutes and trumpets we have a column of air in vibration the air being matter in a gaseous state is made up of tiny little particles or molecules and it is each of these molecules of gas far beyond even microscopial vision which vibrates to and fro as each little molecule has as it were to nudge his neighbour into motion it is natural that the energy thus transmitted soon dissipates itself so that the molecules at a distance do not receive any appreciable disturbance unless the sounding body is in very violent vibration and even then the sound soon dies away in the air as the distance increases as a matter of fact the air does not conduct vibrations sound nearly so well as a liquid which has much greater elasticity and on the same principle a solid is a better conductor of sound than a liquid the string telephone which although merely a child's plaything is yet of much scientific interest is a good illustration of a solid body the string conducting sound better than the surrounding air early in the last century a london professor gave a very good illustration of this property of solids to an audience in the polytechnic institution in london a band of musicians were placed in a room in the basement of the building and from this room long solid metal rods were carried right up through the principal hall and into a room on the upper floor where they were attached to ordinary sounding boards a number of rods and boards being used simply to increase the effect when the musicians played in the basement the audience in the upper room heard the music as clearly as if it were being performed there but in the principal hall through which the rods passed no sound was heard this illustration enables one to realize what a good conductor of sound a metal rod is but it is quite evident that these vibrations when handed on from one to another of myriads of molecules will soon dissipate as the length of the rod is greatly increased and in addition there will be a certain amount of damping or lessening of these vibrations at each point where the rod is supported it was really in connection with this set of rods and boards just described that the word telephone was first invented in order to express the idea of carrying sound greek phone to a distance greek tele it is quite possible to have a speaking telephone of this nature over a limited distance in such a telephone we have a metal disc against which one person speaks while the distant listener stands opposite a similar disc the two metal plates or discs being connected by a tightly stretched wire it is marvellous that a flat metal disc receiving vibrations conveyed by the wire from the distant disc can set up exactly the same vibrations in the air as the speaker's voice does at the other end it is indeed an extraordinary feat on the part of a piece of flat metal to reproduce all the variety of air vibrations for the production of which we require the complex machinery of lungs vocal cords mouth teeth tongue lips and nose it is evident that if the proper vibratory motion can be given to a metal disc by any means the disc will speak the required vibrations are far too complex to be imitated by any purely mechanical arrangement although an american some twenty years ago did construct a speaking machine by closely imitating the arrangement of our human organs of speech while the machinery was most ingenious and was controlled by a keyboard similar to that of a piano but used for the opening and closing of valves etc and while the results were most remarkable yet many words were very indistinct and all the sounds were too uniform and drawling the only way in which we can give a metal disc the proper vibrations is by either directly speaking in front of it or by communicating to it these vibrations already given to another disc in the phonograph 
we speak against a very thin glass disc or diaphragm which by means of an attached cutter makes little indentations on a rotating cylinder of specially prepared wax the disc may again be made to reproduce the speech by rotating the cylinder and allowing the point of a connecting lever to bob up and down as it were in the indents and thus set the attached disc once more vibrating exactly as it did on the first occasion when influenced by the speaker's voice we can now imagine one metal disc in london vibrating in sympathy with a similar disc in say glasgow provided we can pass on the vibrations from the one disc to the other of course a direct connection of a stretched wire of vibrating molecules is quite out of the question as already explained but a very simple way out of the difficulty is found with the aid of an electric current the speaker talks against a little disc of iron which we may imagine as being a somewhat elastic lid to a metal box filled with powdered carbon the current on its way from a battery to the line wire has to pass through the carbon it is as though a short piece of the wire had been cut out and this box of carbon inserted in the space the powdered carbon offers a great resistance to the passage of the current but if the carbon is compressed even very slightly it permits more current to pass and the speaker by speaking sets up air vibrations and causes such pressure on the disc and the enclosed carbon the variations of this pressure cause an ever varying current to pass out from the battery through the carbon and along the line wire one may imagine it as an undulatory current having a great variety of waves and when this reaches the distant end of the wire it is led through the small coil of an electromagnet in front of which is placed a metal disc similar to that in the transmitter at the sending end the metal disc will be attracted by the electromagnet in degree according to the current passing in this way the disc in the receiver is set into motions exactly similar to those of the disc at the speaker's end when the listener places the little disc close to his ear the disc in turn sets the air into exactly similar vibrations to those which the speaker is producing in front of the sending disc and therefore the speech is heard just as though the speaker's voice was directly operating on the listener's tympanum or eardrum we have therefore in the telephone the speaker's voice controlling the battery current which on reaching the distant receiver produces a varying magnetic field thus influencing a little iron disc and thus setting it into exactly similar motion to the controlling disc this is only a very general description there are other details which we need only mention in passing when the telephone is supplied with electricity from a small primary battery the current passes through a small induction coil and is intensified in pressure then there is the little electromagnetic machine a small dynamo which is driven by a handle and sends out a powerful current to operate the receiver's bell as this bell is only for calling attention it is automatically switched out of the current while speaking when that part of the instrument carrying the transmitter and receiver is lying at rest on its stand the end of the line wire is in contact with the bell circuit but as soon as the speaking part is lifted the holder rises by a spring and in so doing it switches the line wire to the telephone proper in the first form of telephone in which this powdered carbon was used the little metal box or case containing it was fixed to the wall instrument and as the powder would keep gravitating to the bottom of the enclosing case the speaker was requested to shake or turn the case occasionally such instructions are very apt to be overlooked but by fixing the transmitter in one piece with the receiver which was formerly the only part one hung up and took down to operate the switch the speaker is made to shake up the carbon in the transmitter each time he uses the instrument without receiving any instructions to do so by improvements recently made in the transmitter it is now unnecessary to move or turn it in any way to maintain its efficiency it is of interest to note that this transmitter with the granular carbon which is now in full command of the field was invented by an english clergyman named hunnings two other very useful inventions made by clergymen are the power loom and the hosiery machine at the time of writing the first edition of the present volume each telephone in use in this country had its own primary battery beside it 
but in america it had been suggested many years previously to supply all the current from a central battery at the exchange and dispense with the individual batteries at the subscriber's instruments in this connection the following remark was made in the first edition it seems probable that all telephones will some day be worked from a central battery at the exchange although the system has not found much favor as yet since that time many exchanges have been arranged on the central battery system with complete success through the courtesy of the national telephone company in glasgow i have had an opportunity of seeing the working of one of the most modern exchanges on the central battery system before describing this exchange a few preliminary remarks may be helpful originally the telephone was used merely for speaking between two particular places just as an ordinary speaking tube is used it may be mentioned in passing that the general public looked upon the telephone as a scientific toy at first however it soon became apparent that if all telephone lines passed through one public office it would be possible to connect any two of the distant instruments together prior to this time the post office had given intercommunication between private telegraph lines using the old a b c dials no doubt it was this fact that suggested the telephone exchange the first exchanges were very small so that connecting arrangements were very simple the telephone users became known as subscribers as they had to pay a subscription or rent to the company who supplied the telephone instruments and undertook to make all the necessary connections so that they could converse with all the other subscribers when one wishes to be able to connect a portable electric lamp to several places in a house one gets the electrician to bring the ends of the wires carrying the current to a convenient position on the wall the wires are then attached to two little sockets and the portable lamp is provided with two small fingers or plugs which fit into these sockets and can be withdrawn at will the same idea is made use of in connecting one pair of telephone wires to another pair in the early days only one wire was used for telephony its two ends dipping into the earth at the extremities just as telegraph lines of the present day are arranged all the subscribers wires were finished off with a little socket or jack these jacks were arranged close together in a table when the exchange operator was asked to connect one subscriber to another she used a short length of flexible wire having a plug on each end placing one plug in the jack belonging to the first subscriber and the second plug in that of the other subscriber she united their wires and enabled them to carry on conversation in the early days when there were only a few hundred subscribers a telephone exchange was comparatively simple a modern exchange may have to deal with as many as ten or twelve thousand subscribers and in order to provide means of connecting together any two of that great congregation of wires a great deal of ingenious planning has been necessary it will be of interest therefore to see the workings of a modern exchange i may remark in passing that it will be apparent to all that a subscriber cannot call to an operator please connect me to mr john smith the subscriber must look up the telephone directory and state merely the number by which mr john smith is known we are just so many numbers to the telephone operator until within recent years one was able to recognize a telephone exchange by the great congregation of wires over the top of the building Today there is no such conspicuous sign and one might pass a modern exchange without suspecting that it was such this change is not accounted for by the advent of wireless telephony which by the way will occupy a special field of its own and as far as one can see at present it will not come into competition with ordinary telephony the reason of the change referred to is much simpler it is merely that the congregation of wires has been carried along under the ground instead of overhead there are many advantages in this change each cable may contain as many as twelve hundred wires these are all carefully insulated from one another and protected on the outside by a heavy lead tube it is common practice to have six hundred or even eight hundred pairs of wires in one cable each subscriber requires a pair of wires to give a complete circuit for his telephone as the original plan of an earth circuit has been dispensed with as already mentioned i have been amused in noting the different ideas that friends have formed of the interior of a telephone exchange 
some have even pictured a large hall with a multitude of telephone instruments each instrument representing the exchange end of a subscriber's wire however most of the public have clearer ideas today photographs of the interiors of some exchanges have been published in the public journals we are all familiar with the subscribers instruments in their homes and offices we may picture the wires from six hundred different subscribers instruments all coming together and passing into one cable which is buried under the streets the other end of the cable comes up under the telephone exchange here we find several similar cables coming up through the floor of the apparatus room the amateur electrician finds it quite a task to separate the ends of a small cable containing half a dozen wires and find the two ends of the same wire imagine what it must be to separate a cable of twelve hundred wires the first thing the telephone engineer has to do is to separate these wires and fix the end of each wire to a suitable connection upon one side of the main distributing frame he takes the wires just as they come without considering the number of the subscriber after getting these securely fixed he attaches to each certain safety devices there is some risk of a telephone wire getting in contact with an electric light wire and conducting a heavy current into the exchange two of the safety devices are to protect the apparatus in the exchange against the entrance of any such current these protectors consist of a fuse and a heat coil they give way under the heat produced by a heavy current and as soon as they break they cut the circuit or send the intruding current to earth the third safety device is to protect the exchange apparatus against lightning should it happen to strike a telephone wire this lightning arrestor consists essentially of a small air gap across which the lightning charge can jump to an earth wire whereas the ordinary telephone current cannot cross this air gap and has to keep to its continuous path the lightning on the other hand finds it easier to take this short cut to earth rather than go through the apparatus in the exchange the difference of behavior between the battery current and the lightning discharge is due to the fact that the former is impelled by a low electrical pressure while the electrical pressure of the latter is millions of times greater after getting each wire securely fixed with these safety devices the wires are continued over to the other side of the distributing frame each wire being taken from this point to a second frame in numerical rotation number one subscriber's wire is now in the first position on this frame and so on with the others these are extended to a third frame carrying apparatus the use of which we shall understand better when we have seen what is taking place in the switch room where all the connecting and disconnecting of the subscriber's lines is carried on when we enter this room we see an upright board extending right round the room this is the board which holds all the little sockets or jacks representing the ends of the subscriber's wires we find the operators sitting in a row around the room facing this upright board as may be seen in the photograph each of these young ladies has a very light telephone receiver held against her ear by a suitable fastening around her head the transmitter of her telephone which is supported by a light frame hung upon her shoulders has a long funnel coming close up to her mouth standing in the switch room one scarcely hears that any conversation is taking place at all first of all we had better get a general idea of the operator's duties they are to attend to all the calls made by the subscribers and make the necessary connections between subscribers disconnecting them when requested an operator must be able to connect the subscriber calling with any number requested this means that each operator must be able to reach from number one socket or jack to number ten thousand it is necessary on this account to bring all the jacks into as small a space as possible consistent with efficient construction the space required makes a board opposite which three operators may sit with comfort and yet so arranged that each may reach to any one of the ten thousand jacks on the board while each of these operators could connect any two of the jacks with a flexible cord it must be clear to all that these three operators are not going to attend to the calls of the whole ten thousand subscribers one hundred subscribers will keep an operator fairly busy but she could connect any of these with every other subscriber asked for to answer the calls of the whole ten thousand subscribers will require about one hundred operators each attending to about one hundred subscribers 
there is nothing for it but to fit up duplicate boards each containing the whole subscriber's jacks and let every three operators have a complete board we may picture the pair of wires of number one subscriber coming up from the apparatus room and entering the switchboard at the first section they are fastened to number one jack then passing on to the next section they are fastened to another similar jack also marked number one so on the wires go through the whole long board around the room being tapped at each section and connected to a socket or jack fixed there the whole arrangement is called the multiple board because of this multiplication of jacks for each subscriber's line we are ready to see how the subscriber is to communicate with the operator several different plans have been tried i can remember in the early days we used to go forward to our telephone instruments and ring up the operator that is to say we turned the handle of the little magneto-electric machine just as we did when ringing a subscriber after being connected some subscribers fondly imagined that they were actually ringing a bell in the exchange and if they did not get immediate attention they would continue to ring like a house on fire i used to ask these friends what sort of pandemonium they thought a telephone exchange must be like imagine hundreds if not thousands of bells all ringing at one time in one room these impatient subscribers were quite disappointed to learn that all their high-pressure energy merely caused a very small lever to drop the shutter of a little indicator and expose the number of the subscriber making the call after this almost noiseless operation was performed the remainder of the current which was intended to waken up the operator merely caused the tiny lever to move a small fraction of an inch another plan adopted to give subscribers a prompt means of communicating with the operator was to have the operator always listening on a public call wire this wire passed through a certain section of the town and branch lines were dropped from it into the subscribers offices or homes as many as sixty subscribers would be connected to one call line the telephone instruments were not connected directly to this wire but as long as the subscriber depressed a button on his instrument he switched his telephone on to this public call wire the advantage was that he could get in touch with the operator at any given moment the disadvantage was that a number of subscribers might all attempt to give calls at the same time and unfortunately many of them seemed to think that whoever would cry the loudest would get the best attention the result was that the poor operator was often at her wit's end to make head or tail of the jumble of noises this call wire system is most convenient in districts where the subscribers are not too numerous and where there is no great rush of business another plan was to give each operator an answering jack for each subscriber to whom she had to attend these were sockets or jacks similar to those in the multiple board but additional to them these answering jacks were grouped together below the others right in front of the operator beneath each answering jack there was a tiny electric glow lamp in diameter about the size of a large pea at the other end of the line the subscriber had a button on his instrument which if depressed caused the little lamp in the exchange to light up in this way the operator knew when any of her one hundred subscribers wanted to speak to her the latest plan is really an improvement on the last mentioned the operator still has the answering jacks and the little signal lamps but things have been made very easy for the subscriber he has not to trouble about any signalling he merely lifts his telephone off the hook and this action causes the signal lamp to glow with the latest methods the operator is able to answer within five seconds so the subscriber will doubtless think she has been waiting his call just as the operator on the call wire used to do indeed one gentleman using this new system has told me that the operator answers so quickly sometimes that he suddenly forgets what he was about to say it is worth while inquiring what really happens when the subscriber lifts his telephone off its support the support being freed of the weight of the telephone springs up and completes the subscriber's circuit with the exchange this causes a current from the large battery at the exchange to operate a signaling instrument attached to the subscriber's line on the third frame mentioned in the apparatus room this little signaling instrument called a relay consists of an electromagnet which attracts an armature to it 
and thus switches on the necessary current to light up the small lamp beside his answering jack on the operator's board as long as the subscriber keeps his telephone off the hook the little relay in the apparatus room will keep the current switched on to the lamp when the operator inserts the plug which is attached to one end of her connecting wire into the answering jack this lamp goes out the insertion of the plug in answering the call puts current onto a second relay arranged beside the first one in the apparatus room this switches the current off the first relay causing the lamp to go out as mentioned and the insertion of the plug at the same time brings on the necessary lighting current for the signalling lamp representing the connecting wire there are two lamps one representing each side of the connecting wire the two ends of this connecting wire come up through the operator's table and the plug stand upright in front of her the flexible wire hangs down beneath the table until the plugs are lifted when it comes through the table a weight suspended beneath the table keeps the flexible wire always taut and pulls it back through the table when the operator frees the plugs from the jacks so far the operator has used only one leg of the connecting wire she has inserted this in the answering jack whose light glowed by moving a small lever into what is called the listening position she switches her own telephone on to the calling subscriber and learns from him the number of the subscriber to whom he wishes to speak the operator now lifts the second plug on the connecting wire and puts it into the jack of the number wanted she then moves the little lever from the listening position to the ringing position and this causes an electric current from the apparatus room to reach the subscriber's telephone and his bell rings the ringing current is supplied by a generator driven by a motor the operator holds the key over to the ringing position for a second or so then releases it until the subscriber wanted answers the ring thus given the lamp on that side of the connecting wire glows but immediately he takes the telephone off the hook the lamp goes out this gives the operator intimation that the subscriber wanted has answered the call the operator knows that both subscribers have their telephones off the hooks and she leaves them connected if one lamp glows while the other remains out she still leaves them connected for very probably one subscriber has merely put down his telephone while he goes to make some inquiry when both lamps glow this is accepted as the signal to disconnect the operator is entitled to presume that they have finished as they have both laid down their telephones she therefore withdraws the connecting plugs it will be observed that the subscriber has not to call off this is always a trouble in other systems for a subscriber omitting to call off is supposed to be engaged the only possible chance of a subscriber being left engaged after he has finished is if he goes away and leaves his telephone off the hook even this contingency is provided for it would seem hopeless to get him as the operator cannot ring his bell so long as his telephone is off the hook she reports the matter to a test clerk who switches on the howler this produces a howling sound not unlike a siren in the subscriber's telephone this calls the attention of the subscriber to his carelessness in leaving his telephone off the hook it is obvious that two subscribers at different boards may call for the same number at the one time what is to prevent an operator connecting a third party to a line already in use she can tell by touching the subscriber's jack with the connecting plug before she inserts it if she hears a clicking sound in her own telephone she knows that the line is already connected elsewhere so she intimates engaged sorry to the subscriber asking for the number other operators at a separate table deal with connections to other exchanges but we need not trouble with more detail as the general principle is the same as that just described there is of course this difference that the two subscribers jacks which are to be connected lie in different exchanges this necessitates the use of a junction line one end of which is in the one exchange and the second in the distant exchange these calls are described as junction calls one interesting feature in connection with these calls is that when the operator puts down the key to ring the subscriber wanted it is automatically held down it is so arranged that the ringing current from the generator is cut off and put on at the end of every few seconds after the manner of some alarm clocks until the subscriber wanted lifts his telephone off the hook 
immediately he does this the current which holds the key down is automatically switched off and this in turn cuts off the ringing current in this way the operator's time is not wasted waiting the reply of a dilatory subscriber while the bell of his telephone continues to ring until he answers then there are trunk calls which signify connections requiring to be made between two subscribers who are in different towns a subscriber in london may converse with a friend in scotland or france and so on there is one point which is sure to be of interest to telephone users instead of renting the telephone for a certain annual subscription it is becoming common to charge so much per thousand calls how in the world is an operator going to keep count of all the calls each of her one hundred subscribers makes in a day she is kept busy enough connecting and disconnecting subscribers without attempting any system of bookkeeping again the obliging automation comes to her assistance down in the apparatus room each subscriber's wire is provided with a tiny meter or register anyone who is familiar with the small cyclometers put upon cycle wheels for counting the mileage will understand the general principle a train of wheels turns the figures on an indicator but the meter must not work every time the subscriber lifts his telephone off the hook to call the exchange the number he wants may be engaged and he will not be willing to pay if he has not obtained the connection he asked for it is the operator therefore who actuates the meter when a subscriber has got his message through the operator depresses a small key or button in circuit with the connecting wire she is using this sends a current to the meter of the calling subscriber and registers one call against him the telephone subscriber therefore pays for his calls on the same principle as he pays for his gas or electricity each operator also has a meter which registers the total number of calls she attends to each day this however is merely for the use of the telephone manager it will be remembered that there are no batteries at the subscriber's telephone the whole of the necessary current is supplied from the exchange about one dozen large accumulators serve for everything these are charged by means of suitable dynamos one advantage is that no matter how long a conversation may be continued the current remains constant the primary battery on the other hand used to give trouble as its current fell off very quickly if kept too long on the line without a rest there is no doubt that the central battery system has come to stay at least until some other newer method makes its appearance in the united states of america there are several telephone exchanges which are worked without human operators the connections and disconnections being made automatically one of these exchanges has eight thousand subscribers the method of calling a number will be understood by referring to the left-hand illustration facing page one fifty two the legend below the photograph will explain the action the electric impulses sent out by the subscriber in calling the number desired operates a selector the construction of which is shown in the right-hand photograph on the same page when the subscriber signals the number of hundreds in the directory number of the subscriber he wishes the center rod in the selector moves up three sections if the number signaled is in the three hundreds this upright rod carries with it a little arm or finger which is to make connection with the other subscriber's line at present we have imagined it to be raised to the section containing all the numbers beginning with three hundred the next set of impulses from the calling subscriber moves the little contact finger to the flat or row containing the number wanted if it is among the fifties then five impulses are received and that raises the finger to the fifth row the next set of impulses representing the units cause the rod to turn round and bring the finger along the row to the first second or whatever number is required among the fifties thus if the subscriber signals the numbers three five and seven successively the connecting finger will raise to the three hundred the fifth row and the seventh line in that row his telephone will be connected to number three fifty seven when the subscriber who originated the call puts his telephone back on the hook the automaton disconnects the line by allowing the upright rod in the selector to return to its former position of zero the disadvantage in a purely automatic exchange is that the company lose all control of the system 
to take an illustration we may suppose that subscriber a is a rather eccentric individual and because he has a grievance against subscriber b a connects his telephone to that of b but does not ring him so long as a leaves this connection of which b is not aware and which he could not disconnect so long will no one else be able to call b in other words one subscriber can purposely hold up the line of another subscriber to the disadvantage of the latter there is now a telephone which might by the uninitiated be supposed to possess brains for if its owner is absent when a friend rings him up it will accept the message on its own account and repeat it to its master on his return and no matter how long he is in returning or how many friends have confided messages to it it never suffers from loss of memory but gives a correct recital of all the information or secrets that have been entrusted to it this instrument is called a telegraphone and its general principle may be briefly stated if one pictures for a moment the telephone transmitter sending out a varying current to the distant magnet as described in the earlier part of this chapter and if one recalls how the magnet acted upon the disc or diaphragm then we have only to replace the stationary disc by an iron wire passing in front of and slightly touching the magnet the wire being thus magnetized by the influence of the electromagnet which is varying under control of the speaker's voice the wire therefore receives as it were a great number of spots of different degrees of magnetization which it is capable of retaining the wire being made of mild steel the wire is now analogous to a phonograph cylinder with a record upon it this reproduction of the sound is very easily understood if one imagines the little magnet of a telephone receiver instead of being magnetized by the incoming current from a distance being now merely put in contact with this magnetized wire which when drawn across the electromagnet impacts similar degrees of magnetism to it the magnet thus influenced will in turn operate an ordinary telephone diaphragm and thus set up similar air vibrations to those originally imparted to the telephone that used the wire as a record as the telegraph phone is now a reliable piece of apparatus there may be quite a large commercial field for it how much more reliable to have a clear-headed instrument accept a message and re-deliver it instead of having to cross-examine a careless servant as to whether mr so-and-so said this or that End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the romance of modern electricity this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the romance of modern electricity by charles r gibson chapter fifteen wireless telephony the telephone receiver in wireless telegraphy early attempts at transmitting speech speaking along a beam of light speech transmitted between two parallel wires the latest methods when considering the different methods of picking up the signals in wireless telegraphy we saw that one convenient arrangement included a telephone receiver in which the operator heard a series of clicks representing the morse code this arrangement led to some confusion in the early days of wireless telegraphy Newspaper reporters and others seeing these experiments believed that speech was being transmitted. At that time, most of us had no great faith in wireless telephony coming into practical use over any long distance. It was one thing to send signals by means of sudden disturbances in the ether, such as those waves produced by a torrent of sparks, but it required something better than that to transmit the more delicate alternating current used in telephony. Indeed, if we had to depend entirely upon the spark method of transmission, we could not have produced an efficient wireless telephone. With the introduction of continuous trains of ether waves, however, it became possible to transmit articulate speech. It is true that a wireless telephone existed before the days of wireless telegraphy, but as this consisted practically in speaking along a beam of light, it was evident that the distance over which this might be used must be very limited. It seemed as though this method could remain only an interesting scientific experiment. This principle has been adapted for short ranges, such as between ferry boats and the shore. 
The general principle of the foregoing may be of some interest. The telephone had not been invented for any length of time when it was discovered that speech might be transmitted along a beam of light. The beam of light, either sunlight or electric arc light, is focused onto a little flexible mirror made of silvered glass or mica. The speaker's voice causes this little mirror to vibrate, just as though it were the disc or diaphragm in a telephone transmitter. The vibrations of the mirror disturb the beam of light which it reflects towards the distant receiver where it falls upon a selenium cell. This cell possesses the strange property of altering its electrical resistance in proportion to the amount of light falling upon it. We may picture the selenium cell as being somewhat analogous to an ordinary bell push, but infinitely more sensitive. You may press a bell push and allow the current to pass, or you may let go the push and stop the current, but the selenium cell allows different amounts of current to pass according to the amount of light falling upon it. If only a little light falls upon the selenium, then only a little current is allowed to pass. An increase in light means a corresponding increase in current. By this means, the varying beam of light controls the current in the telephone receiver, so that the vibrations of the little mirror at the speaking station are imitated by the diaphragm in the telephone receiver. In this way, the original speech is reproduced at a distance. It is interesting to note that in the experiments made with this light telephony, it was found possible to speak from both stations simultaneously, the two beams of light not interfering with each other. Speech has been transmitted over a distance of about eight miles by this method. There is one point which might appear to be a difficulty. How is the sending station to focus the beam of light onto the receiver of a moving ferry boat? This difficulty is not a real one, for the beam of light will have spread out to a breadth of several hundred yards if the distance be great. The action is all the more remarkable, as only a very small portion of the beam of light will reach the receiver. It is quite obvious, however, that the maximum distance over which this system may be used cannot exceed a few miles. In the chapter on wireless telegraphy, I have referred to the early system used by Sir William Priest. It will be remembered that the principle was one of induction between two long parallel wires, one at the sending station and the other at the receiving station. It was found possible not only to send signals, but to transmit actual speech over a distance of several miles. The electric current sent out by the telephone transmitter is a to and fro, or alternating current, so that every variation of current in the long transmitting wire induces a corresponding current in the distant parallel wire at the receiving station. The one disadvantage is that the length of the parallel wires has to be increased as the distance between the stations is increased. An installation upon this plan has been at work for many years between the lighthouse on an island called the Scaries and the mainland on the coast of Anglesey. The distance is a little short of three miles, and under ordinary circumstances one might think it best to lay a submarine cable. But the sea bottom at this point is so rough and the tidal current so strong that a cable would be quite useless. The island is a small one, but it was found that a short wire of less than half a mile on the island, with a parallel wire of about three and a half miles on the mainland, was sufficient to give good induction between the stations. The convenience of being able to carry on an ordinary conversation between the lighthouse and the mainland will be appreciated. While the ordinary spark discharge was useless for transmitting speech, it was found that by more rapid sparking arrangements, much better results could be obtained. But the great strides which have been made in wireless telephony are not based upon a spark discharge. A continuous emission of ether waves is produced by rapid electric oscillations in an aerial wire, and this emission is controlled by the speaker's voice. What happens is this. 
we have two persons separated from each other by many miles and without any connecting wires between the two places one of the men speaks into a telephone transmitter the connections from which end in an upright aerial wire at his own station at the distant station the second man listens at a telephone receiver connected to a similar and local aerial wire the speech is transmitted between these two aerials in the form of ether waves the diaphragm in the telephone transmitter sets up a to and fro current in the ordinary telephone circuit and this current is made to act upon another neighboring circuit in which a high frequency current is continuously surging the variations in the telephone current cause similar variations in this powerful current these electric oscillations are conducted to the aerial wire and in this way the surrounding ether is disturbed those ether waves travel out towards the receiving station and are intercepted by the aerial wire at that distant place there they affect a suitable wave detector such as an electrolytic cell by this means a local battery current is controlled and this actuates an ordinary telephone receiver in this way the original speech is reproduced some wireless telephone companies have been guaranteeing distances up to one hundred miles for several years back it is now possible to speak over a distance of about two hundred miles as proof of the importance of wireless telephony I may state that the United States Navy have equipped a number of their battleships with installations for speaking up to distances of 25 miles. For greater distances, more power would be required. The problem of tuning to prevent interference is of even greater importance in wireless telephony than in telegraphy. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of the Romance of Modern Electricity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 16. Induction Coils Explained. If one holds onto the handle end of a poker while the other end is placed in a fire, one soon feels considerable heat passing to the hand, till the metal ultimately becomes too hot to hold any longer. We may say that the poker has conducted heat from the fire to the hand, and in the same way we may think of the telegraph wire conducting electricity from the battery to the distant telegraph instrument. In these connections, we speak of the conduction of heat and of electricity. But we receive heat from the sun over a space of millions of miles in which there is nothing to conduct the heat. As more particularly stated in another chapter, we receive the heat from the sun by means of the ether, which does not conduct heat at all. We picture the heat of the sun setting up waves or vibrations in the ether, which in turn sets up heat on the earth. We might say that the heat in the sun induces heat in the earth, and in the same way we find electricity in one body inducing electricity in a neighbouring body with which it is not in contact. In speaking of electricity which has been thus induced, we say it has been produced by induction, and so by an induction coil we mean a machine by which a current of electricity in one wire or coil will induce a similar current in a second or separate coil. One may naturally ask what advantage is to be derived by doing this. The result of a preliminary experiment seems rather disheartening. We fit up two coils, connecting one to a battery, and we place the second coil near it, this coil being attached to an instrument for detecting the flow of a current. The diagram, figure 10, shows this simple arrangement with a bell push inserted between the battery and number one coil, so that we may conveniently switch off and on the current at will. We know that as soon as we press the push, a current will flow in number one coil. We press the button, and watching the detecting instrument in the other coil, 
we see its indicator fall to one side, showing that a current of electricity has been set up in number two coil, and it is clear that this current must have been produced by induction from the battery current in number one coil, as there is no connection between the two coils. Still keeping a finger on the push, we notice that the indicator has gone back to zero, showing that the current is no longer flowing in number two coil, although the battery current is still flowing in number one. When we let go the push, we notice the indicator in number two coil move once more, but this time in the opposite direction. And by repeating the experiment, we find that every time we make or break the battery current in number one coil, a momentary current is set up in number two coil. There is the same amount of current set up at make as at break, but the latter takes place in a shorter time and is therefore more intense. So to simplify matters, we will leave the current produced at make out of account altogether. We need only remember that each time we press and let go the push in number one coil, a momentary current is set up in number two coil. The quicker we press the push, the more of these transient currents do we set up, and if we could make them follow very closely at each other's heels, they would make practically a continuous current. We cannot hope to operate a bell push rapidly enough to get this effect, and so automatic contact breakers are required. The induction coil may be made to do this itself, as will be explained or the make and break may be obtained by a small motor driven by a separate battery. Part of the circuit may consist of a metal point dipping into mercury, and the motor may raise and lower the point alternately, producing the necessary make and break. There are other methods, but first of all we wish to see what advantage an induction coil is going to give us. We may imagine number one coil sending out electromagnetic waves in the ether, and these waves, as they fall on coil number two, setting up a current in this coil. It is the changes in this field of influence which give rise to the induced current, for as long as the battery current keeps up a steady influence, no current is induced in number two coil, but only when the waves are being set up or withdrawn does the current appear in the neighbouring coil. The more of these waves or lines of force we can entrap, the better result we get, and we find the effect increased for every turn of wire we add to number two coil. So we make this coil a very fine wire in order to get a great many turns into the field of influence. If we made the two coils exactly alike, we should gain nothing, and even now we cannot hope to increase the amount of electricity, but we may alter its condition. We may think of the battery current in number one coil, as an easy flowing current of considerable volume, while in number two coil we have a small current at a very great pressure. It is difficult to find any convenient analogy, but I think one may liken the process to that of a mechanical lever. A workman wishes to move a large stone, but finds it too heavy. He gets a simple bar of iron, and putting one end under the stone, he places some obstacle under the bar or lever near to the large stone, and then applying his energy to the free end of the lever, he finds he can easily move the heavy stone. From whence did he get the increase of power? Energy cannot be created by a simple iron bar or by any other means, but it is apparent that the workman moved the free end of the lever through a far greater distance than the stone was moved, so that he merely concentrated his energy. We might speak of the energy he put into several feet of movement being concentrated into several inches, and this may serve as a rough analogy of what an induction coil does. It cannot increase the energy, but it concentrates it, and we have a very high voltage, or pressure, sometimes reaching over a million volts. A single battery cell gives a pressure of from one to two volts. When the principle of an induction coil is once grasped, the construction is readily understood. Number one coil, which is the battery circuit, is called the primary coil or circuit, while the coil in which the current is to be induced is called the secondary circuit. The electromagnetic effect of the primary coil is increased about 30-fold by placing a piece of iron inside the coil. 
A bundle of iron wires is used as they magnetise and demagnetise quicker than a solid piece of iron does. The battery or primary circuit is wound around this bundle of wires, the coil being of course carefully insulated, or otherwise the current will not go round and round the coil as is desired. One may always think of the insulation being to the current what a pipe is to water or gas. The two ends of this primary coil are connected to the battery, there being a contact breaker inserted between one end and the battery, as was represented in the diagram, figure 10, by the bell push. The secondary coil of very fine wire is wound directly on the top of the primary coil, but very carefully insulated from it, and its two ends are left free, being merely finished off in convenient terminals, so that any desired piece of apparatus may be connected in circuit with this coil. As already indicated, the contact breaker may be worked by the induction coil itself, for the bundle of iron wires, becoming a magnet whenever the battery current flows round them, may be made to attract a piece of iron attached to a spring, which, when attracted forward, breaks the path of the current from the battery. Immediately the circuit is broken, the bundle of iron wires lets go the spring piece, which, coming once more to its normal position, allows the current again to pass, whereupon the spring is again attracted forward, and so the make and break is kept up continuously. The motion is exactly that of the gong stick in an ordinary electric bell, and it is the rapid to and fro movement of this spring that causes the monotonous hum in the air when an induction coil is at work. The breaking of the battery circuit might be accomplished by turning a wheel round, having contact pieces at intervals on its periphery, and indeed this method was employed prior to the automatic arrangement just described. One modern method is to give a rapid motion to a contact lever by means of a small motor driven by electricity. There are also electrolytic contact breakers now in use, but the object of all is merely to obtain a rapid make and break of the battery circuit. The only other point to mention is that a condenser made up of insulated layers of metal foil is placed in the wooden base of the instrument to act as a laden jar. The induction coil is also supplied with a switch to turn off and on the battery current at will and also a commutator switch so that the direction of the current may be reversed. If a glass tube from which the air has been as effectively withdrawn as possible be now coupled to the induction coil, a beautifully luminous effect is produced in the tube. This phenomenon has led up to some most important uses of the induction coil, which will be dealt with in the following chapter under the title of Light That Does Not Affect the Eye. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Romance of Modern Electricity this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avahi in July 2022. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 17. Light that does not affect the eye. All light is of itself invisible. Early observations leading up to the discovery of the X-rays. How we are able to see the living skeleton. The means by which invisible rays are made visible. How the X-rays are produced. Some applications of the Röntgen rays. The title of this chapter may appear rather clumsy, but the expression light visible and invisible, which is so much in use at present, has always seemed to me misleading. I remember how, when quite a youngster, I was very much impressed by the fact that all light must be invisible. Walking along one night in the dark, I pictured the sun at the other side of this great globe, but sending his rays of light away out into space, reaching to the other planets. It was quite apparent then that light must be invisible, or we should see these rays of light beyond the shadow of the earth, and so I was impressed by the fact that all light is invisible before I came to learn the scientific explanation of the matter. 
as already pointed out it is really a necessity that we should have a new word to denote light as an ether disturbance so that it may not be confounded with light sensation in the material retina and optic nerve we have a great variety of ether waves as explained in a later chapter only a very small proportion of these waves affect our eyes but while the retina is not disturbed by some rays of light these affect the chemical preparation on a photographic plate we are all now quite familiar with the so-called shadow graphs produced by the röntgen rays or as professor röntgen named them the x-rays which remind one of algebra that x be the unknown quantity by the way those who have examined such photographs carefully must have noticed that they are not merely shadows but that there is a great variety of density and that there is no flatness as in a shadow but the objects are rounded off like solid bodies when in eighteen ninety six it was announced that the living skeleton could not only be photographed but might be plainly seen upon a screen and the movements of every bone watched the whole civilized world was at once interested there was a sort of fascinating eeriness about the subject which doubtless gave it a wider interest than scientific discoveries usually produce it will be of some interest to see how this very important discovery came about there must have been a great number of observed facts leading up to this for even the greatest scientists do not stumble across discoveries unless they are making their way along some definite path in which this previously unobserved phenomenon lies the now famous german professor did not invent the röntgen rays they had been present in many experiments for a long time back but had not been observed in the primitive electrical machines in which the ether disturbance was produced by the experimenter holding his hand against a revolving glass cylinder or globe it had been noticed that if the air was withdrawn from the globe by means of an air pump a beautiful glow of light appeared inside the globe when it was excited by rubbing against the hand this luminous effect was not present unless the globe was approximately a vacuum this was known some one hundred and seventy years ago and about that time it occurred to one experimenter to try if this luminous effect could be produced in the vacuum globe by electrifying it from another machine instead of exciting the globe directly by the hand the polish scientist who tried this was delighted to find that when he passed a charge of electricity from one of these primitive machines through a vacuum tube the luminous effect appeared and he at once proposed to use this light in mines and places when ordinary light was dangerous if this method of lightning had been tried in any dangerous mine i fear the consequences might have been serious for it would have been very difficult to prevent sparks passing from the highly charged wires and these sparks would be quite sufficient to cause ignition of gases followed by explosion however we find that for more than a century and a half this light produced by an electrical discharge in a vacuum has been known to scientists and to those interested in such matters when a discharge passes between two points in ordinary air producing a spark the air offers a great deal of resistance to the electricity and the disturbance caused by the discharge is of quite a violent nature the same of course holds good if the discharge takes place inside a tube filled with air but if we connect the tube to an air pump and commence to withdraw the air we soon find that there is not the same resistance to the electrical discharge and that we are able to place the two points much farther apart and still get a discharge as the air in the tube becomes less we find the discharge becoming quite silent and instead of repeated sparks there is a constant stream of luminosity even when we have got the best vacuum that is possible we must not imagine that there are no molecules of air left in the tube for it can very easily be proved that the light is dependent upon some particles of air remaining if the tube be filled with any other gas such as hydrogen and the pump made to withdraw all the gas it can the discharge in the so-called vacuum remaining is quite different in appearance from that which took place after the ordinary air had been withdrawn from the tube 
there is now a blue glow with a crimson effect in the centre and if the tube has been filled with a mixture of gases before the pump is applied the effect of an aurora borealis on a small scale may be produced it is therefore evident that the luminous effect is produced by the particles of air or gas left in the vacuum and we may imagine these remaining molecules to be bombarded about by the discharge so rapidly in the free space now at their disposal that they become luminous with improvements in air pumps it was possible to produce more rarefied vacuums and we are indebted to our great english chemist sir william crookes for much progress in this branch of science crookes produced tubes with such high vacua that the diffused luminosity or glow concentrated itself into a direct stream between the two conducting points as though it were a luminous thread and he found that a magnet held near the tube would deflect this stream from its direct path it was also observed that when these rays fell upon the glass of the tube they made it glow with a green or bluish phosphorescence these rays are now famous in the scientific world and are called cathode rays before these rays become observable the air in the tube must be as greatly rarefied as it is away up about one hundred miles above the surface of the air while professor röntgen of würzburg was working with some of these high vacuum tubes he found that there were other rays originating from the point where these cathode rays impinged upon the glass or upon any other obstruction by further experiment he found that these unknown or x-rays would pass through a great many bodies which were quite opaque to ordinary light other substances were able to stop the rays and when caused to fall on a photographic plate they set up the same chemical action as ordinary light producing a negative in the usual way when developed Röntgen thus showed that a photograph of the bones of the hand might be taken if the hand was interposed between the tube and the photographic plate we shall see in the following chapter the very great boon that this discovery has been to suffering man crookes had already shown that if he caused the cathode rays to fall upon different crystals by placing them in the path of the cathode stream the crystals became phosphorescent or fluorescent it had also been observed that if a piece of glass coloured greenish by uranium were moved along in the spectrum produced by light passing through a prism the glass reflected the colours as ordinary glass would do but when moved along beyond the visible spectrum at the violet end the glass still showed the green tint although there was no apparent light falling upon it that is to say there were light waves which did not directly affect the eye but which were changed by striking upon the uranium glass and then became visible when the sun's rays pass through a glass prism the different wavelengths are separated and fall upon the floor or wall in a band of beautiful rainbow colouring with the appearance of which we are all familiar at one time it would have seemed ridiculous to suggest that there was anything more than the visible spectrum but now we know that there are rays beyond this limit in both directions although the eye does not detect them those beyond the violet end of the spectrum will affect the photographic plate while some will even illuminate a fluorescent screen in the other direction beyond the red end of the spectrum we find the rays or ether waves which affect the wireless telegraph receiver a fluorescent screen such as used in x-ray work is merely a cardboard coated with some fine crystals such as platino cyanide of barium the ether waves striking upon these crystals are so altered that they are brought within the scope of our vision in other words when the invisible x-rays fall upon the crystals they cause these to send out ether waves which do affect our eyes the illumination of the screen lasts only so long as the x-rays continue to impinge upon the crystals there are other phosphorescent substances which continue to emit light after the stimulating waves have been withdrawn when the x-rays fall upon a fluorescent screen they illuminate it evenly all over provided there is no obstacle between the tube and the screen to intercept the x-rays if the hand be held between the tube and the screen 
a shadowgraph or radiograph is produced upon the luminous screen the principle of the x-ray tube will be understood from the diagram on page 181 the cathode rays impinge upon the little sloping target and this bombardment sets up the ether disturbance known as x-rays when we come to consider the nature of electric phenomena we shall see that the so-called cathode rays are composed of very small particles which cannot escape through the glass whereas the x-rays being merely an ether disturbance can pass out through the glass of the tube we are not sure of the nature of the x-rays further than that they are a disturbance in the ether possibly a series of splashes or thin pulses the value of the x-rays to us as far as photography is concerned is due to the fact that they can penetrate many substances which are opaque to light the x-rays have little difficulty in passing through a wooden box they penetrate the flesh of the hand with ease but have their way blocked by the bones of the fingers there are other applications such as the detection of imitation gems a real diamond is quite transparent to the rays while imitation ones are practically opaque the x-rays have been used also in testing the manufacture of electric cables by passing the cable between an x-ray tube and a fluorescent screen the inside of the cable insulation may be examined and faults located the presence of foreign bodies in the insulating material is easily detected the x-rays have also been of great value to the scientist but their practical application in the medical world far surpasses any other application likely to be made end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the romance of modern electricity this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the romance of modern electricity by charles r gibson chapter eighteen how electricity produces light the first idea of an electric light discovery of the electric arc what happens in an arc lamp how we came to have incandescent lamps the true meaning of combustion edison's first idea for a glow lamp a common error in comparing gas and electric lighting an interesting old lady artificial daylight it would be difficult to say when the very first thought of an electric light entered the mind of man for such an idea might even have been suggested in some way to the philosophers of many ages ago it is recorded that one ancient philosopher had observed sparks emitted by his stockings while in the act of undressing and in these tiny sparks we see some connection between electricity and light early experimenters must have been more impressed with this connection when the primitive frictional machines came into use for in the dark some beautifully luminous effects were produced it is not probable however that these distant workers ever dreamed of a practical electric light early in the nineteenth century that very thoughtful cornish experimenter sir humphrey davy made an important discovery having coupled together the whole of his battery of two thousand cells he connected a carbon pencil to each of the two battery wires whereupon he found that if the carbons were made to touch each other thus completing the circuit and if then gradually separated the spark between them became a very brilliant continuous arch or arc of light not only do the carbon points become white-hot but a continuous stream of volatilized particles fills the intervening space the carbons gradually waste away but it will be understood that the heat and light are in no way dependent upon combustion the arc is maintained by the electric current which is necessarily at a high pressure to overcome the great resistance offered to its passage across between the carbon points the arc lamp with which we are all familiar in our streets railway stations or public buildings is nothing more than a machine to feed the carbons forward as required and to start or strike the arc unless the carbons are put into contact with each other to start with the current cannot get across from the one to the other but when the current is turned on the carbons are in contact with each other and as soon as the current passes the lamp automatically separates the carbon points and thus forms the arc 
an arc lamp placed in the focus of a large reflector in a lighthouse tower may be visible for at least twenty or thirty miles on a clear night and indeed very powerful lamps equal to hundreds of thousands of candles may be discerned at a distance of over one hundred miles quite recently a flashlight has been put into st catherine's lighthouse in the isle of wight which is estimated at fifteen million candle power and which should be seen from the french coast in clear weather in connection with the arc lamp it is interesting to note that no matter how close the carbon points are brought to each other at the outset no current will pass until they actually touch then they quickly become heated and when separated a bridge of carbon vapor is formed between them if an arc lamp hisses then one knows that the carbon points are not far enough separated or if there is a flashing and spluttering the distance is too great but an up-to-date arc lamp works very steadily indeed an arc lamp was used in eighteen fifty eight when the foundations of westminster bridge across the thames were being laid but while this is sometimes quoted as the first time that an electric light was used for a practical purpose it is not really so as the parisians some eleven years earlier eliminated the place de la concorde by means of an arc lamp in the arc lamp it is of course necessary to replace the carbon sticks or pencils continually owing to their wasting away as already mentioned but of late years many arc lamps have been made in which the carbons are enclosed in a globe into which the air leaks but slowly thus preventing the carbons wasting away so rapidly while the carbons in an ordinary open arc do not last more than twelve to sixteen hours an enclosed arc lamp may burn for a hundred and fifty hours before requiring new carbons which means a considerable saving not only in carbons but also in the work of attending to the lamps we have seen that sir humphrey davy was the first to produce the electric arc giving us the basis of arc lighting and as the same ingenious experimenter showed that a continuous stick of carbon could be made white-hot by passing sufficient current through it he has at least given the suggestion of another method of lighting no doubt davy's mind would be absorbed with the heating property of the arc as that would appeal to him strongly he being a great chemist but this will be dealt with later in the chapter on electricity as a heating agent if a wire or thread of carbon is made white-hot by passing a current through it the carbon will very soon disappear owing to combustion and it was the prevention of this waste that made electric lighting by means of a carbon wire possible some people find it difficult to see quite clearly how it is that electric light has to take the fact of combustion into account and yet that it is in no way produced by combustion i think this matter may be explained by a very simple and well-known experiment if a lighted candle is placed inside a large glass bottle and its mouth closed the candle burns for a little time but its light soon becomes fainter and fainter and then disappears a second lighted candle lowered into the bottle will now immediately go out the reason for this result is no doubt plain to all the bottle at the outset contained a certain amount of air dependent entirely upon its capacity and when the lighted candle was put in the bottle was corked so that no air could escape or enter no air has passed out of the bottle and yet the candle will not burn it is therefore evident that the condition of the air must now be quite different there has been a chemical change going on the carbon in the candle when heated has been able to unite with the oxygen of the air and thus has formed carbon dioxide commonly called carbonic acid gas the chemist signifies this by the symbol c o two which reads that a molecule of this new compound is composed of one part of carbon and two parts of oxygen in chemistry each element has a distinctive and easily remembered symbol as c for carbon o for oxygen h for hydrogen c u for copper z n for zinc and so on the chemical symbol for water will therefore be h two o a water molecule being a combination of two parts of hydrogen with one of oxygen to return to the bottle with the extinguished candle it becomes apparent that the uniting of the carbon of the candle and the oxygen of the air has ceased and as a good deal of the candle remains and can be relighted outside of the bottle it is evident that all the oxygen of the bottle full of air has united with the candle's carbon so that no further chemical union can go on 
to this act of chemical combination we give the simple name of combustion and in the case of the lighted candle when we keep it well supplied with oxygen as we do in burning it in the open air the combustion will go on as long as there is any candle left it is this combustion that causes the candle to give heat and light for the minute particles of carbon become white hot and luminous we must have the combustion and consequent change of material to have the lighted candle for if we prevent the combustion by taking away all the available oxygen we of course get no chemical union and therefore no light but if we can raise and maintain a white heat by some other means than combustion then the conditions are quite different it was known from the onset that a current of electricity heated the conductor through which it was flowing and the greater the resistance offered to the current the greater the heat sir humphrey davy showed a wire of carbon raised to a white heat by the passage of an electric current so that all that remained to be done was to prevent any oxygen getting near the heated carbon it is from the air that the carbon steals the oxygen so our best plan is to keep the carbon out of the way of temptation by shutting it up where it cannot get a hold of any air this is easily accomplished by sealing up the carbon in a glass globe after exhausting all the air from it by means of an air pump the carbon may now be raised to a white heat by the current and made to glow but combustion is prohibited and therefore there is no appreciable waste some tiny particles of carbon do manage to free themselves from the carbon filament as may be seen in a lamp that has been long in use by a blackening of the inside of the globe these glow lamps are descriptively named electric incandescent lamps the carbon filament in one of these lamps is very fine so that it offers a very poor passage to the current and therefore is more easily heated whereas the metal wires leading to the lamp and into the carbon are much better conductors and allow the current so free a passage that the heating of them is quite inappreciable the temperature of the little carbon filament is somewhere about three thousand four hundred fifty degrees on fahrenheit's scale although sir humphrey davy's carbon stick became heated by the passage of the current it did not at first seem possible to use carbon in any suitable form for a small lamp so the early experiments were all made with very fine metal wires of different alloys the great difficulty however was that when a fine metal wire became white hot and gave light it was very apt to fuse one might picture this result as due to the molecules while clinging together by their natural cohesive force reaching such a rapid rate of vibration that they are no longer able to hold on to each other and so the wire gives way the metal tending to change into liquid form there is not this trouble with carbon and after finding metals unreliable edison made a suitable carbon wire by cutting thin slips of bamboo grass and charring them while another practical filament was made by swan by carbonizing a linen fibre with sulphuric acid footnote in modern manufacture the materials for making the lamp filaments are dissolved into a solution having a consistency similar to that of treacle this semi-liquid is then forced through small tubes coming out as a continuous thread or wire which is then placed on carbon moulds of any desired shape and thereafter placed in a furnace and carbonized End of footnote. the appearance of an ordinary glow lamp is familiar to all and while the filament looks quite substantial while the lamp is glowing it will be found to be a very fine thread of carbon if examined while the current is not passing this apparent difference in size is merely an optical illusion due to the intense light from the white-hot carbon impinging with considerable force upon the retina of the eye and causing as it were a spreading of the sensations to more of the retina than the directly affected part thus conveying the idea of a larger image this effect is known as irradiation and may be observed not only with brightly luminous objects but even between black and white bodies a very stout person looks stouter when dressed in white than when in black and so on these glow lamps have certain advantages over gas or other artificial illuminants and not the least of these is the fact that they do not steal any of the oxygen of the air which we ourselves require to inhale in order to keep up the combustion in our bodies unless sufficient oxygen can by means of our sponge-like lungs be brought within reach of our vitiated blood with which it unites 
we soon feel a difficulty in breathing and a lack of energy which as we are well aware if carried to excess will mean a complete cessation of our vitality each ordinary gaslight steals as much oxygen as several able-bodied men so that it is very necessary to keep a room which is illuminated by gas well ventilated and indeed we too often forget that we ourselves are incessantly demolishing the beneficial oxygen in the air of a room and that it is therefore of much importance that at all times there should be a plentiful supply of fresh air the chemical products of a gaslight soon tarnish and dirty the decorations of a room so that the electric glow lamp has a distinct advantage in this respect without discussing the matter of comparative cost it may be mentioned that some consumers having possibly read comparative statements of the cost per candle power between gas and electricity are surprised to find their electric bill considerably higher than their former gas bill but they will find the reason to be that they are using far more candle power than they formerly did they would not be content to light a room electrically with the same candle power as they previously used with gas for the glow lamp does not emit such a penetrating light and if only the same candle power were provided the room would appear to have a much poorer light in addition to the great convenience of electric light and the advantage of its leaving our life-sustaining oxygen alone it is less heating which for some purposes is an advantage there is practically no risk of fire from glow lamps if installed by expert workmen it may be noted in passing that in the electric arc lamp the carbons being exposed to the air are subject to combustion but this is merely an effect and not the cause of the light as already explained i remember an old lady who had been bedridden for some twenty years having met with an accident at the age of seventy-two but retaining clear mental faculties up to the time of her death at the age of ninety-two or ninety-three it was most interesting to find what ideas this old lady had formed about this electricity which she had never seen at work nor heard or read about further than from general remarks in the daily newspapers she asked many interesting questions and in connection with electric light which she had never seen in any form she wanted to know if the electricity burned in the lamp like gas or oil it was quite a natural and a thoughtful question and it is doubtful if a great many people who are quite accustomed to the use of electric light ever realize this point that while gas and oil are consumed in burning in the sense of combustion as already indicated it is quite different with electricity as it merely does its work and passes on it is something like a river when sees guided to a water-wheel and after turning the mill passing on its way as before to its great reservoir the sea in the case of the river we know that the sun has evaporated some water from the ocean and deposited the vapor aloft in clouds and that later the vapor has again liquefied and fallen upon the mountain tops whence collecting it together gradually forms a river which on its way back to the ocean will do useful work in turning a water-wheel etc if we consider electricity as a disturbance of the ether ocean and the dynamo as a pump then we have some sort of analogy but as was already pointed out it is impossible to find any adequate analogy for electrical matters we agree to speak of a current of electricity not that we believe there is a flow in the same sense as a stream of water and while we find it convenient to think quite freely of the carbon filament of a lamp as offering so much resistance to the current that the carbon becomes heated and glows we must not imagine anything akin to mechanical friction and resistance we must express our ideas about electricity figuratively and it is only if we forget that these expressions are arbitrary that any misunderstanding arises indeed it was only when the early theories were formed no matter how crude they may now seem to us that advancement in matters electrical was made possible electrical engineers have done much to cheapen the cost of producing electric current for lighting purposes but within the last few years a great reduction in the cost of electric light has been accomplished by means of glow lamps made upon a different plan instead of employing a filament of carbon very fine filaments of rare metals have been used in one class of lamps of which the osram is well known the metal is tungsten the filaments of these lamps are made of the rare metals whose names they bear 
the metals are produced from their compounds in the form of fine metallic powder which is then mixed with a suitable binding paste and squirted through small apertures to form the fine filaments these are placed in a mixture of gases and an electric current is passed through the filaments causing the ingredients of the binding material to combine with the gases while the particles of the rare metal become welded together these metallic filaments become white hot very much more easily than the carbon filaments some of the metallic filament lamps now in use take less than one-third of the electric current required for a carbon filament lamp of the same candle power this is a great step in advance and places electric light in a very much stronger position if we can continue making strides of this kind electric light will soon have no rival End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the romance of modern electricity this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rick Cordray. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 19. Electricity from Mechanical Motion. A Powerful Substitute for Batteries. How a Dynamo Works. Alternating Currents. An Analogy. Whence the Magnets Get Their Current. Advantages of Alternating Currents. Sir Humphrey Davy used a battery of 2,000 cells to produce his historic electric arc, and all the early electric lamps were worked in a similar manner by batteries. As the upkeep of a battery means the renewal of the zinc plates, etc., and a great deal of attention when a large battery is used, it is quite clear that electric lighting would never have come into general use unless some better substitute had been found to replace the expensive and troublesome battery. The finding of a suitable substitute was arrived at in this way. Our great British scientist, the late Michael Faraday, found that if a loop of wire were moved up and down between the poles of a magnet, there was a current of electricity set up in the wire. Faraday pictured a magnetic field between the poles of the magnet, and his imagination filled this space with lines of force and he said it was when the coil or loop of wire passed through these imaginary lines that a current was originated. It was quite evident that it was only as long as he kept the coil moving up and down in the magnetic field that the current was present in the wire. The next step was to mount a coil of wire on a spindle and revolve it in the space between the poles of a magnet, and, as was anticipated, the effect was greatly enhanced because the coil could be made to pass through the imaginary lines of force much oftener. The little magnetoelectric machines sometimes used for medical purposes, but perhaps oftener for amusement by dealing out electric shocks, are simply arrangements by which, when one turns a handle on the outside of the box, a coil is made to spin round in the neighborhood of a magnet. It then occurred to people to make such machines on a very much larger scale and to use steam engines to drive the coils round at a great speed. Such contrivances were called dynamo-electric machines, which name we have discarded, merely using the word dynamo, from the Greek dynamis, or force. In the small experimental machines at first constructed, ordinary steel magnets were used, but in order to get a stronger magnetic field, these were soon replaced by electromagnets. A dynamo now consists of a coil or coils of wire mounted on a shaft or spindle, this part being called the armature, and driven around at a high speed between the poles of an electromagnet. It is all very well to know that there is an electric current set up in the revolving coil, but how are we to get the current away from the continually moving coil? We cannot, of course, have wires directly attached to the coil, as they would be twisted and broken off as soon as the coil began to spin around. We can, however, keep in touch with the revolving coil by a very simple arrangement, as shown in a diagram in the text. A single rectangular loop of the wire is here shown with the two ends attached to two pieces of metal, which have been bent round the end of the spindle, but insulated from it and from each other. These we will call the contact pieces. 
two flat pieces of metal, marked B in the diagram, and called brushes, although they perhaps look more like combs, press against the contact pieces on the shaft. On looking at the diagram, it is now clear that the current has a path out from the loop by the top brush, through the wire attached, which may lead to a lamp, and back by the lower brush to the coil, thus completing the circuit. When the coil or loop revolves, the brushes will, of course, keep in touch with the coil, but they will change partners as regards contact pieces at each half rotation. This changing of partners is very convenient, for when the coil in its revolutions enters the magnetic field in front of the north pole of the magnet, the current flows in one direction, while on leaving that part of the field the current set up is in the opposite direction. So what we really have in the coil as it spins around is a current pulsating first in one direction and then in the other at every half revolution. Again, looking at the diagram, it is clear that if the current is passing out from the loop or coil by the top contact piece, the brush touching it will conduct the current away to the main circuit, in which are placed the lamps, etc., while the current returns by the lower brush. Let us follow the lower contact piece only. As it leaves the lower brush, the current in the coil changes in direction, so that by the time it reaches the top brush, the current, instead of entering the coil by this contact piece, is now leaving it. When the other contact piece was in the same position, it was also the exit for the current. And so we find that whichever contact piece is uppermost, it is the exit for the current in the coil. And in this way, the brush, fixed at the top, is always leading out the current. We therefore have a current flowing in one direction through the outer circuit. If we had two different objects, one hot and the other cold, and if we imagine these two bodies changing alternately from hot to cold, one always being hot while the other was cold, we could place the left hand on the hot object and the right hand on the cold object, and then changing the position of the hands just as the bodies change temperature, we could always have the left hand on the object that was hot and the right hand on the cold object. If this were possible in practice, we should have a continuous flow of heat through the body from the left hand to the right. In similar fashion, we have a continuous flow of electricity from the one brush to the other, the brushes standing stationary, and the changing contact pieces moving from one brush to the other. It is a simple case of two negatives making a positive. Instead of consisting of flat pieces of metal, the brushes are usually made of little blocks of carbon carried in a suitable holder, and these give a splendid rubbing contact with the armature's contact pieces. Instead of there being only two contact pieces, as in the diagram, a large armature is built up of a number of separate coils, each coil having two contact pieces, arranged so that the brushes simultaneously touch the two ends of one coil, then the two ends of the coil following it, and so on. Instead of having only one electromagnet surrounding the revolving coil, it is now common to have several magnets arranged to act together, so that the coil passes the poles of each magnet in rotation. But the general principle is represented in the simple diagram shown in the text. Remembering that in the revolving coil there is really a quickly pulsating current, first in one direction and then in the other, let us try and get at this current directly without converting it to a continuous current. If we take away the two contact pieces shown in the diagram and place two complete rings alongside each other on the shaft, insulating them from each other and from the shaft, we may now fasten one end of the coil to each of these ring contact pieces. If we then place the top brush in contact with one ring and the lower brush against the other ring, it is clear that each brush will always remain in contact with its own ring and there will be no interchanging of partners, as was the case with the first arrangement. Consequently, there will be no reversal of the current coming from the coil, so we shall have a pulsating current in the outer mains, just as we have in the revolving coil itself. Such a pulsating current, first in one direction and then in the other, is called an alternate or alternating current, and a dynamo arranged with these complete rings is called an alternator or an alternating dynamo. The arrangement of contact pieces and brushes on a continuous current dynamo is termed the commutator, 
as it commutes or changes the current. For a diagram of alternator, see the page in the text. Before leaving these dynamos to see what we can do with them, there's an interesting point to note. Where is the large electromagnet to get electricity from to produce its magnetism? We simply steal some of the current that the dynamo is generating and pass it round the magnet. That is all very well when we once have the currents coming from the dynamo, but how are we to get it started? When a dynamo has once been used, the iron of the magnet always retains a trace of magnetism sufficient to set up a very weak field. When the coil revolves very rapidly in this, a correspondingly weak current is produced, which goes to augment the magnet, and so on, till very quickly the dynamo is in full working order. When a dynamo is constructed, there is usually sufficient magnetism in the iron itself to set up a weak field at the very outset. But if not, it could be easily momentarily coupled to the electric supply mains. It is very convenient to be able to feed the magnet with the current which it is itself producing, but we can only do this with a continuous current dynamo. The current going round the magnet must be all in one direction. And so, where the electricity is being led away from the dynamo as an alternating current, it will not do to pass this round the magnet. To work an alternating dynamo, we therefore require to have a separate exciter, which consists of a small continuous current dynamo, or, if there be a number of alternating dynamos working in one station, it is more convenient to run one continuous dynamo to feed all the magnets. It might seem very inconvenient to have a pulsating current continually changing its direction in the circuit, but while at first this class of dynamo was left severely alone, it has of recent years come well to the front. Before considering the advantages which have brought this dynamo into a prominent position today, let us see what takes place in a circuit in which an alternating current is at work. If a small glow lamp be put in the circuit leading from an alternating dynamo, arranged just as described, and if the alternations of the current be slow, there will, of course, be a great unsteadiness in the light, as the current will practically cease at the moment of change from one direction to the other. If, however, the armature coil is driven round at a very high speed, the current may be made to change its direction as often as 50 times in one second. With such rapid alterations, the light will be perfectly steady as far as we are able to detect it with our eyes, for at each fiftieth part of a second we have a light thrown upon the retinas of our eyes, and as the image of a bright light will not fade away for about one-tenth of a second, each of the fifty pulsations in the lamp will overlap its predecessor, and we may imagine our eyes receiving, as it were, a perfectly continuous somatograph impression of a quickly pulsating light. Even at this speed of 50 alternations in one second, there is bound to be a sudden rise and fall in the current at each pulsation, although not visible to the eye. For some purposes, even this would be detrimental, but this further difficulty is overcome by winding two separate coils on the one armature and arranging them so that when the current is at its turning point in the one coil, it will be at its maximum in the second coil, or better still, if three separate coils and pairs of brushes be used, the defect can be further reduced. We can imagine an alternating current as a wave swinging to and fro, and this we call its phase, so that when two coils are used, and there is, as it were, two separate waves overlapping each other, this is called a two-phase current. Or we may speak of a machine with three coils as a three-phase alternating dynamo. When describing the principle of the arc lamp, it was noted that the particles of carbon broke away from the point of the carbon pencil at which the current enters the arc, and it is therefore obvious that this carbon will waste away very much quicker than its neighbor, in point of fact about twice as quickly. If we now use an alternating current, the current will be first entering at one pencil and then at the other, so that both will waste away equally, which is a considerable advantage in favor of an alternating dynamo as far as arc lighting is concerned. Another advantage, which has been recognized in these alternators, is that we can conveniently obtain a much higher voltage or pressure, which makes the distribution of current over a long distance much easier, 
and the alternating current is very simply changed from a high voltage to a lower one or vice versa. Of course, the alternating current is of no use for some purposes, as, for instance, electroplating, in which process a steady current is required to carry the metal over from the plating material to the article being plated. However, an alternating current may be made to drive a motor, which in turn drives a continuous current dynamo, and in this way a current of the one class may be altered to a current of the other class at very little loss. In speaking of these dynamos, I have only mentioned a fixed magnetic field and a rotating armature in which the current is induced. But it is, of course, as easy to have these two reversed. And so we have some dynamos in which the electromagnets form the moving part, the coils in which the current is induced being stationary. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of The Romance of Modern Electricity this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rick Cordray. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 20. Mechanical Motion from Electricity. A Mysterious Machine. How Electricity Makes the Motor Go an explanatory experiment, a dynamo may be a motor, the source of the motion, a lecturer's amusing experience, an early idea, a motor requires a dynamo, a great advantage, gigantic power carried by a dormant wire, present clumsy methods, a coming revolution. When one goes into an engine room, and looks at an engine at work, there is, to many, a peculiar fascination about the machine, though not because of any mystery, for we are all familiar with the expansive power of steam which gives the impelling force to the piston. But when one watches the armature of an electric motor spinning quietly round at a high speed, one does feel a sense of mystery. And it is not surprising to find that the electric motor is a source of wonderment to the majority of people. Of all the subjects connected with electricity, I have found that the outsider seems particularly interested to learn how electricity can drive machinery and make a train or car go. Whether it has been a deputation of artisans from the city with a request for a lecture, or a conversation with an intelligent farmer in a country district, the one question that seems to be uppermost is just, how does electricity make the motor go? If we're content to know how it is done, to the same extent as most people understand how a steam engine works, then there is no difficulty. In explaining the principle of the steam engine, one might point to a kettle of boiling water on the fire, the lid of which was being repeatedly lifted by the expanding steam. To explain the electric motor, I would point to a little magnetic needle being attracted by a magnet brought near to it, and say that that is the way electricity makes the motor go. It is simply a case of magnetic attractions and repulsions. I take the little magnetic needle, pivot it on its stand, and having painted the North Pole red so that it may be easily distinguished, I bring a steel bar magnet near to it. I first of all hold the South Pole of the bar magnet toward the North Pole of the needle, and the needle at once swings round toward it. But when it comes round to the bar magnet, I quickly turn the latter around in my hand thus pointing its north pole toward the needle. This pole now repels the north pole of the needle, causing it to continue on its circular path. And with a little practice, I soon find I can set the little magnetic needle spinning round on its center. This is just the principle of what happens in a motor. Instead of a little magnet balanced on a pivot, there's a coil of wire mounted on a spindle. And in an early chapter, we saw that a coil of wire, having a current of electricity flowing through it, was in every respect a magnet. In place of the bar magnet, which I held in my hand, there is a large electromagnet, the poles of which surround the coil magnet mounted on its spindle. It will not be convenient to keep changing the poles of this huge magnet as I did with the bar magnet, but if we let this magnet remain constant, and we change the direction of current in the coil magnet at each half revolution instead, the result will be the same. 
It will be remembered that when we pass a current of electricity through a coil in one direction, the one face of coil becomes a north pole and the other a south pole. But when we reverse the current, sending it through the coil in the opposite direction, then the north and south poles change places. It is apparent that this motor, which we have now built up in our imaginations, is simply a dynamo, a large electromagnet with an armature or coil between its poles. But we're going to do just the reverse of what we did with the dynamo. We caused the armature of the dynamo to be driven round at great speed, and we led away a current of electricity from the revolving coil. We had a rapidly changing or alternating current in the coil, but by means of the commutator and brushes we led the current out in one direction into the mains. In the case of the motor, we are now going to lead the same kind of current back to the brushes, taking the current from another dynamo, and as soon as the current enters the armature coil, its poles will be attracted by the poles of the large electromagnet surrounding it, and it has been so placed that this attractive pole will cause it to turn round on its spindle half a revolution. At this point, the armature coil will have its ends in touch with the opposite brushes from which it started, and so the current is reversed in the armature, causing it again to turn a half revolution. It is now back to the position it started from, and so sets off once more, the current reversing at every half revolution. In this way it soon gathers speed. The quicker it goes, the oftener it will reverse its points of contact with the brushes, so the revolving coil really becomes a magnet, changing its poles at an almost incredible speed. Referring again to the simple explanatory experiment from which we set out, it is just as though I held the bar magnet steady, having a separate bar magnet stationed with its opposite pole at the other side of the magnetic needle. Or it might be simpler to think of a large horseshoe magnet, with its legs spread out to allow the magnetic needle to spin round on its center between the poles. Thus, having a steady magnetic field, or influence, it is necessary that the magnetic needle, when turning into the position to which it is attracted by the magnet, should then reverse its poles, and receive a further attraction to make it continue on its journey. Of course, it is impossible to have a permanent magnetic needle changing its poles continually to suit our convenience, but the magnet formed by a simple coil of wire, carrying a current, will behave in this manner, and so electric motors are not only possible, but thoroughly efficient and powerful engines. A boy holding a magnet near to the magnetic needle of a small pocket or pendant compass can make the needle move round. By carefully reversing the position of the poles of his magnet, he may make the magnetic needle spin round. It is the same power which makes the motor go. By applying mechanical motion to a dynamo, in revolving its armature, we get electricity. And by giving the same machine electricity, its armature revolves and we get mechanical motion. In the latter case, we call the dynamo a motor. Of course, in actual practice, there are differences of detail in construction, depending upon whether the machine is to be used as a dynamo or as a motor. When one becomes accustomed to the idea that a coil of wire carrying an electric current is a real magnet, then there is no difficulty in understanding the principle of electric motors. But I trust that the foregoing explanation will not meet with the same fate as did one explanation of this matter given in a lecture I heard recently. The lecturer had been requested by the chairman, a bailey in the town in which the lecture was being delivered, to explain how electricity made the cars go. The lecturer explained the matter in his own way, and he no doubt was somewhat surprised and amused when the worthy Bailey, in proposing a vote of thanks, said that the lecture had been most interesting, but for the life of him he could not see yet what it was that made the cars go. When speaking of a dynamo and a motor being exactly the converse of each other in action, it is interesting to note that if two electrostatic machines, such as those described in an early chapter, be connected together by wires, so that the high tension charge generated by the one machine when rotated is led to the collectors of the second glass or vulcanite plate machine, the latter will begin to rotate also, its plates being attracted round by the charge on its collectors. 
The reversibility of dynamo and motor should not really appeal to us as anything strange, for we have the same converse actions in everyday life, as, for instance, when a windmill is driven by the wind, thereby producing mechanical motion, while on the other hand we may apply mechanical motion to a windmill or fan, driving it round and producing a wind, as is demonstrated by a ventilating fan. In the early days of electricity, the distinguished American professor, Joseph Henry, constructed an electric motor on quite a different principle from that which we have been considering. Imagine a pair of beam scales with two iron pans, and at a little distance underneath each, an electromagnet. If an electric current be sent first to one magnet, and then to the other, and so on, alternately, the beam of the scales will be made to rock or seesaw, just as one sees in an old beam engine. The up-and-down motion of the beam turns a crank, which drives the flywheel round. This early electromotor was arranged to automatically switch the current from one magnet to the other at each stroke, but the principle of the machine entailed a very great waste of power. Of course, the machine was not made in the form of a pair of scales, but the principle was just as described. Whenever we see an electric motor at work, whether in a workshop or a factory driving machinery, or on a tramway car propelling it along, we may be quite sure that there is, possibly at some considerable distance, a dynamo being driven round by an engine, and also that there must be a wire or cable carrying the electric current from the dynamo to the motor. Of course, it is possible to drive a motor by means of a powerful storage battery, as is often done, but not economically. One may ask, what is the use of first driving a dynamo by an engine and then making the dynamo drive a motor? It is clear that we cannot get as much power from the motor as we get from the engine itself, for there must be some waste of power in friction, etc., both in the dynamo and the motor. There is certainly nothing to be gained in this direction but the actual loss in power is surprisingly small, the motor giving about 90 horsepower for every 100 horsepower of the engine. The dynamo and motor are, however, a very great advantage, because they give us a most convenient means of conveying power to a distance. We can have a powerful engine with a dynamo fixed at some convenient place, and from this station we can distribute power to anyone requiring it. We can convey the current to a wire stretched along a roadway or public street, and thus allow the motor underneath a moving tramway car to keep in touch with the distant dynamo. Before the days of electrical transmission of power, it was often very difficult to drive machinery in different parts of a works without fitting up various engines in different places. It is interesting to note, in some of the older factories, how our grandfathers had to arrange long belt drives or long connecting shafts from one building to another to convey power. If some engineer, a generation ahead of his time, had come along and said that he could save them all this trouble, for a fixed and stationary wire could carry the necessary power to any desired distance, I have no doubt our grandfathers would have counted him a knave, or would possibly have advised his friends to take better care of him. Today there seems to be little to marvel at, in this possibility of carrying power along a simple wire, for we have become quite familiar with such facts in everyday life. How convenient to be able to carry power by fixed wires to a ventilating fan on the wall or roof of a building, far away from any source of power. What a savings is made in being able to take a drill or other tool to any part of a ship's hull, or to some out-of-the-way portion of a bridge under construction, using wires to carry the power from the distant generator to the tool. At present, we convey great trainloads of coal from our coal fields across the country to our manufacturing centers. One sometimes sees heavy trainloads of coal passing each other in opposite directions, one lot leaving a town and another lot entering it. Then we have to cart the coal about from one place to another, and all of this carrying means a great expenditure of energy. I think one might safely prophesy that some future generation will marvel that we were content with such clumsy methods. It would be possible to convert all the coal into electrical power at the pithead, 
and from there distributed for motive, lighting, or heating purposes to all the surrounding towns. Where no coal fields exist within a hundred mile radius, the coal could be carried to immense generating stations, supplying a great many towns covering a large area. Already there are indications of things moving in this direction. Sir J. J. Thompson has taken a much longer look ahead in his address to the British Association at Winnipeg in 1909. Referring to the enormous quantity of energy lavished upon this planet by the sun, he pointed out that, according to the measurements of Langley, when the sun was high and the sky clear, the heat energy received was equivalent to 7,000 horsepower per acre. Following this up, Sir J.J. J. Thompson said, Though our engineers have not yet discovered how to utilize this enormous supply of power, they will, I have not the slightest doubt, ultimately succeed in doing so. And when coal is exhausted and our water power inadequate, it may be that this is the source from which we shall derive the energy necessary for the world's work. When that comes about, our centers of industrial activity may perhaps be transferred to the burning deserts of the Sahara, and the value of land determined by its suitability for the reception of traps to catch sunbeams. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Romance of Modern Electricity This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Eric Johnson. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 21. Electric Railways, Niagara, etc. When the man in the street sees an electric tramway car for the first time, he thinks it peculiarly mysterious, even although he may be aware that there is an electric motor fixed below the car driving its wheels round. He does not have the same feeling about a horse-drawn car or a puffing engine, for the source of energy in these cases is very apparent. A cable haulage car does not even call forth surprise, as he knows of the endless rope continually traveling along in an underground channel, to which the driver may attach his car and let go at will. The man in the street is more learned than the Chinaman of whom Sir Oliver Lodge tells the story, that when he first saw a cable car in the streets of Chicago, he regarded it for some time with open-mouthed astonishment, and then exclaimed, no pushy, no pulley, go like mad. That the ordinary man, however, does puzzle over the electric car is demonstrated by a conversation reported to have been overheard in London between two Irish laborers. In discussing the principle of electric tramways, one of the men explained that it was the sort of fishing rod on the top that makes the business go. He evidently supposed that the trolley pole was pushing the car along in some mysterious way. It is really because the source of energy is not apparent that an electric car has a mysterious appearance. The motorman merely turns a switch, and no matter how heavily the tram is laden, off it goes. Whenever we see anything in motion, we know there must be an expenditure of energy going on. The car is expending a great deal of energy, and we know there must be a corresponding amount of energy being generated behind the scenes. The car may be miles from the source, but at the distant generating station there is much activity. The stokers are at work looking after the boilers, although their work is greatly lightened by the modern mechanical appliances, which feed forward the coal, weigh it, and then shoot it into the furnace. When we stand and look along a great row of furnaces and boilers and a generating station, and when we think of the tremendous expansive power of steam, we understand the source of energy for the cars. Close to the boiler house we find the engine room, where we see several huge engines at work, each engine being equivalent to four or five thousand horsepower. Here we see enough mechanical motion to drive all the cars in the town. But how is this power to be conveyed to the cars? 
Each engine is directly coupled to a large dynamo, and from these dynamos, wires or cables conduct the electricity along the car routes. If the town be a large one, it is general to have one central station where all the boilers and engines are placed, and where all the necessary current is generated. To transmit this power economically to a distance, it is necessary to have the current at a very high pressure. From this station, the high voltage current is led away to a number of different substations placed at convenient points on the various car routes. The large cables carrying this highly dangerous current, which is probably around 6,500 volts, are well buried under the ground. In these substations, this high pressure alternating current received from the generating station is first of all transformed or stepped down to the low pressure of a few hundred volts. To accomplish this transformation, there is no moving machinery. The current merely passes through a stationary coil of wire and induces another current in a neighboring coil. The change of voltage or pressure being obtained by there being a different number of turns of wire in the two coils. These coils are called static transformers, and their principle is the same as that of the induction coils explained in a former chapter. There is no need of a making and breaking of contact, as the current itself, being an alternating one, is starting in one direction and then in the other alternately producing the constantly changing field of influence required to set up a current in the neighboring coil. The very high pressure current reaching the substation by these underground cables has now been transformed to a low pressure, but it is still an alternating or to and fro current, whereas it is usually preferred to send a continuous or unidirectional current for driving the motors on the cars. This further transformation is easily effected, for we have only to use this current to drive an alternating motor, to which we couple a continuous current dynamo, from the brushes of which we may now lead away a convenient current for the tramway motors. This substation has not generated any of the power, it has merely altered the condition of the current to suit requirements, and the loss of power in doing so is surprisingly small. This final current is then led out by underground cables from these dynamos along the car routes. At intervals along the route where one sees a large metal box at the side of the road, the current is fed onto the overhead trolley wire. The trolley pole, which is attached to the roof of the car, keeps in touch with this bare trolley wire, and the current passes down a wire from this pole to the switch box beside the motorman. He may pass the current direct to the motor under his car, in which case it goes off at a full speed, or he may pass the current through a number of different resistances, only allowing a certain amount of current to get to the motor. By moving his controlling switch, he thus throws more or less of these resistances or coils of wire into the circuit, and he is thereby able to regulate the speed of his motor. After passing through the motor, the current is led by way of the axles and wheels of the car to the rails. It is then led off by cables at short intervals and thus conducted back to the powerhouse. Instead of carrying the trolley wire overhead, it may be placed in a channel under the track with an open slot through which a connecting rod may pass, the appearance of the track being the same as for the cable haulage. But this underground trolley wire is naturally a much more expensive system to install. There is really very little danger from the overhead wires, as they are well looked after, being constantly examined and kept in good repair. The chief source of danger is in telephone wires falling. But guard wires are put up right along the track, immediately over the trolley wire, to prevent the telephone wires getting in contact with the live wire. No doubt, when the government take over the telephones in this country, the overhead network of telephone wires existing in some large cities will entirely disappear, being placed underground, so that this source of danger may be removed very soon. 
Already, horse-drawn tramway cars seem quite out of date. Although London has not yet dispensed with all these antiquated vehicles, these are, however, fast disappearing, and even in quite small towns one finds a modern system of electric cars. It is almost as certain that the steam locomotive will be banished from the railway tracks. How convenient for a railway locomotive to receive its energy ready-made by simply keeping in touch with a stationary wire or rail. If desired, there need not be any separate locomotive, for the passenger car may carry the electric motor itself just as the tramway car does. Electric railways have been built on the continent with overhead trolley wires, but engineers in this country have preferred a third rail placed near the ground to act as the conductor of the current. It is this rail, which is called the live rail, and which at the first caused considerable alarm. As electric traction becomes more common, people will learn to keep clear of live rails, just as one would avoid a red-hot poker. If this live rail danger will only scare trespassers off the railway tracks altogether, it may be the means of preventing much loss of life annually. It is not probable that the traveling public of future generations will be contented with a railway speed averaging about 50 miles per hour. At present, the businessman in London may want to see about some business in Glasgow, but he cannot afford to spend 16 hours in getting there and back, while steam locomotives sometimes attain a speed of 80 miles per hour for a few miles, the best average over a run from 30 to 50 miles is about 70 miles per hour in America and about 60 miles in Great Britain. Already, engineers are turning to electricity to attain higher speeds, and the rate of the expresses of the future would no doubt seem to us at present highly excessive, if not impossible. Already a speed of 130 miles per hour has been attained on trial lines in Germany, while one Russian engineer suggests a scheme whereby he proposes to take passengers from St. Petersburg to Moscow, a distance of 600 miles in three hours' time, which means an average of 200 miles per hour, or more than three miles every minute. An electric railway of a novel character was shown at the Brussels Exhibition in 1897, where a train was mounted on a single rail, supported on trestles, the rail standing about four feet off the ground. The railway cars were arranged like the packs on a mule's back, part of the car hanging down on either side of the central rail in stride-leg fashion. A guide rail ran along on both sides of the trestles to keep the car steady. The train was driven electrically and attained a speed of 90 miles per hour but there is nothing to prevent the speed being greatly increased. This method of building a railway is called the monorail system. We have already seen the electrification of several important suburban railways, and that this subject is one to be reckoned with in the near future is evident from the large amount of space now devoted to it in all electrical journals. It is clear that a motor placed on a train or tramway car, can be kept in touch with the distant generating station, but not so with the motor cars intended to run free on the public roads. In this case, it is necessary for the motor car to carry its own source of power about with it. This is a distinct disadvantage. Not only does it necessitate the independent motor car carrying heavy storage batteries or accumulators, but these will require to be constantly recharged with electricity. For this reason, electric motor cars, or electromobiles, are only convenient where a number of generating stations are within easy reach, as in large cities. In this case, they are a distinct improvement, as they move along in a much less impulsive manner than does the impatient petrol car, they are also entirely free from rapid vibration and smell, and they are very easily controlled, as is clearly demonstrated in one of the illustrations, in which a boy of eight years of age is seen driving his own electric motor car. 
if it were possible to construct an accumulator of very large electrical capacity and yet weighing only a mere fraction of present storage batteries the inventor would undoubtedly make a very great fortune the subject of electric haulage for canals has attracted a good deal of attention both in america and on the continent of europe there are several means of applying electricity for this purpose the canal boat may be supplied with an electric motor on board coupled to an ordinary propeller and the necessary current led to the boat by a trolley wire and pole in the same manner as is done with an electric tramway worked on the overhead system this however is not always convenient and it has been found that the wash caused by the boat propelling itself is very detrimental to the banks of the canal a second plan is to have an electric tractor or motor car on the ordinary towpath the power being got from overhead wires this system is at work in belgium and is represented in one of the illustrations but it has been found expensive owing to heavy upkeep the third plan is a modification of the second one and consists of an electric locomotive running on rails along the towpath the motor getting its current by means of a trolley pole and overhead wire this plan is at work in the united states on the erie canal and it is found that one of these electric locomotives can draw from three to six canal boats at a speed of from four to six miles an hour and this is done electrically at a smaller cost than by mules giving a speed of one and a half miles per hour for many years electric launches have been used as pleasure boats on the river thames and elsewhere the power is derived from accumulators placed under the seats and these work an electric motor to which the propeller is coupled direct the speed of the launch is conveniently regulated by means of a switch in the same manner as already described for a tramway car these boats glide along very gracefully being free from any smoke heat escaping steam or incessant vibration but they are of course dependent upon some neighboring generating station to have their accumulators recharged some boats carry a sufficient power to take them about forty miles without a change of accumulators and this distance they will cover in seven or eight hours going at a speed of from five to six miles per hour with the advance of petrol motors on board small boats the electric launches will occupy a similar position toward these that electromobiles do as compared with petrol motor cars returning to the generation of electric power we find some further points of interest before we can get electricity from the dynamo we must apply considerable power in revolving its armature it does not require much force to spin an armature round on its bearings but when the current is once set up in the coil of the armature it becomes a powerful magnet and is attracted by the surrounding magnet in the opposite direction to which we are rotating it and to overcome this magnetic attraction a force of many thousand horsepower is required if the dynamo be a large one as long as we can supply sufficient power to drive the dynamo it does not matter of course whether it be supplied by an engine a water wheel or a windmill water power in great quantities is not very general but quite a lot of waterfalls on the continent of europe and a few on this island are now harnessed the great center of interest in this respect however is in america where they seem always to do things on a big scale if we only had a niagara falls at hand in the center of our island we should want no other source of energy even the great flowing river of niagara enabled the early settlers along its banks to drive machinery for sawing timber etc but it is only during the last few years that the harnessing of some of its vast power has been undertaken on a large scale many generations ago mechanical engineers must have looked on this great source of energy with envy 
and wished that it were possible to convey this power away to distant places of industry. Electricity makes this dream a reality. Instead of causing the flowing river to turn an ordinary water wheel, some of the water is run off into a tunnel measuring about 20 feet square. The river is about a mile in breadth at this point. It has traveled 20 miles from the Great Lake Erie, and after making a sudden leap over a precipice of 160 feet, forming the Great Niagara Falls, it makes its way to Lake Ontario. Niagara practically drains the Great Lakes of the interior, which have only a total surface area of nearly 100,000 square miles. Some idea of the immense volume of water may be gained when we attempt to picture 18 million cubic feet of water passing over the precipice in every minute of every day. This represents a power of 9 million horsepower, of which about 5.5 million are available for use. The total power of the works already constructed and in course of construction will amount to less than 3 quarters of 1 million, and yet this is a gigantic power. The water for the great power station is got by tapping the river about 1.5 miles above the falls. The tunnel already referred to is cut with a gradient of 36 feet in the mile till it has fallen to a depth of about 200 feet, of which about 140 feet are available for use. A number of deep pits are dug from the surface, each about 160 feet in depth, and these pits communicate with the water tunnel. At the bottom of each pit, is placed a large water turbine of 5,000 horsepower mounted on a vertical or upright shaft which extends right up to the surface where a dynamo is fixed to its top end. We have the turbine or propeller away down at the bottom of the pit being rapidly revolved by the rushing water in the tunnel and on the top end of the shaft we see the moving part of the dynamo being rapidly spun round and generating the electric current. This means a considerable weight on the foundation of the long upright shaft, but the pressure of the water below is ingeniously contrived to relieve this. The recent extension for utilizing the falls on the Canadian side of the river will develop about 375,000 horsepower, which is about half of the grand total already referred to. The Canadian power station will distribute electricity to Toronto, which is about 75 miles distant. The current will leave the power station at the immense pressure of 60,000 volts, and after reaching Toronto it will of course be reduced to working voltages. One power station on the continent of Europe has for many years successfully distributed power over a great distance machinery in Frankfurt being driven from a generating station in Lufon, which is 100 miles distant. The great power station at Niagara has caused quite a crowd of industries to spring up around it. There are grain mills, timber works, paper mills, iron works, engine works, and electrical industries of every description, all receiving power from the Great Falls. Large electric furnaces are also erected for producing aluminum from bauxite, and there is no doubt that ere long the electrochemical industries will receive a great impetus, and what are at present only possibilities will, by means of this great supply of electricity, become active realities. When a select committee of the House of Lords passed the third reading of the Durham County Electric Supply Bill, it was mentioned that the waste heat from the coke ovens and the blast furnaces was being used for the production of electricity, and that the companies promoting the bill had been supplying power at actually less than the power supplied at Niagara. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of the Romance of Modern Electricity. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Prajakta. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 22 Electricity in the Observatory. Visit to an observatory. How the velocity of the wind is recorded. Continuous record of wind's direction. Electricity notes time to 1000 of a second. Far distant earthquakes record themselves in Great Britain. How the apparatus works. A missing link in meteorology. Climbing the hill on which the observatory is situated, the visitor has no difficulty in finding the building. As it is conspicuous with its large rounded dome, which serves as a revolving roof for the large telescope. At the side of the building, one notices a very tall pole on the top of which a little windmill is spinning round. If the visit be made on a fresh spring day, when a stiff breeze is blowing, one finds the little windmill very busy, while on a quiet summer day, it may be practically at a standstill. It is clear that the faster the wind blows past the windmill, the quicker it will revolve. And it has been so arranged that one kilometer of wind passing will cause the little windmill to turn round 1000 times. If we can tell how many thousand revolutions the windmill has made in one hour, we know how many kilometers of wind have passed in that time. As a kilometer is a little more than half a mile, about six tenths, we know that if there have been 8000 revolutions in an hour, then five miles of wind have passed. And so we speak of there having been a wind of five miles per hour. Of course, no one is going to attempt to count the thousands of revolutions performed by the windmill in an hour. It is here that electricity comes to the observer's aid. Two wires laid down from the lofty windmill to the recording instrument placed inside the observatory so that the outdoor apparatus can send signals down to the indoor recorder. The little windmill drives a train of wheels so geared that the last little wheel makes only one revolution for every thousand of the windmill. And as this little wheel makes an electrical contact, which is equivalent to pressing a bell push, at the end of each of its complete revolutions, the recording instrument receives a signal, which indicates 1000 revolutions of the windmill, or in other words, the passing of about one half mile of wind. If the recorder receives 50 signals in one hour, then the speed of the wind is roughly 25 miles per hour. Each signal or impulse received causes an electromagnet to move a pen one upward step across a paper carried on a cylinder or drum which makes one complete revolution in 24 hours. The paper is marked off in hours so that it can easily be seen at a glance how many upward moves the pen has made in an hour. And as each step represents one kilometer of wind, the speed of the wind is radially calculated from the French measure to English miles. A storm will record a speed of 50 miles per hour or may even rise as high as 80 miles. And I have known the little windmill to spin round to the tune of 90 miles per hour. But with a further increase of the gale, the little servant deserted his lofty post and was returned the following day to the observatory in several pieces, having been found in different quarters of the town. By such means, a continuous record is taken of the velocity of the wind day and night. Such instruments are called anemometers from the Greek word anemos signifying wind and metron major. A record is also taken electrically of the direction of the wind.
a little vane on the top of the pole points in the direction from which the wind is blowing and it carries on it a spur or finger which lightly touches a number of little metal studs placed in a circle underneath it there are 16 of these metal studs or contact pieces from each of which a wire runs down to the observatory these represent the 16 cardinal points of the compass north north northeast northeast east northeast east and so on the duty of the vane is to telegraph down to a recording instrument on whichever of these wires it is standing over if the wind be due north then the finger of the vane rests on the end of the wire arranged to represent north inside the observatory the other ends of these 16 wires are fixed in the recording apparatus at the end of every minute a little finger or feeler is made to sweep across these 16 wire ends and the moment it touches the end of the particular wire with which the vane is in contact outside the circuit is completed the current from a battery finds a path to an electromagnet which in turn operates a pen this pen is not normally in contact with the paper but when the magnet receives an impulse it draws the pen sharply against the cylinder and as the pen is carried across the paper along with the feeler the pen is made to mark at the moment the feeler touches the wire upon which the outdoor vane is standing the paper is of course ruled off to represent north north northeast etc it is just as though the vane were supplied with 16 different bell pushes each representing a particular point of the compass and at the end of each minute it press the button that the wind caused it to point to by the method described a continuous record is taken of the direction of the wind at the end of every minute right throughout the day and night climbing up the stairs in the tower of the observatory till he reaches the dome the visitor finds during the night the astronomer observing some phenomenon in connection with one of the planets the observer sits there looking through a huge telescope which he calls his equatorial instrument it points to the open slot of the dome and the whole telescope is being very slowly revolved by clockwork in the opposite direction to that in which the earth is turning so that the instrument remains pointing at the heavenly body the visitor notices two wires leading to the clockwork and he is informed that the speed of this motor clock is electrically controlled by the beat of the standard clock situated downstairs in the observatory the observer requires to read the position of his telescope by means of a graduated scale marked around the axis of the instrument the degrees are so minutely marked off and at such a distance from him that it is necessary to read them through a microscope fixed to the side of the telescope all is dark in the dome and yet the observer must have a light to read this scale by a very tiny electric lamp makes a useful little assistant here for when placed close to the scale at the objective of the microscope it illuminates the scale beautifully and sheds no detracting light in the dome yet another pair of wires attract the visitor's attention and these are leading to something which the astronomer holds in his hand it is a contact maker which is the equivalent of an ordinary bell push and from this a pair of wires laid down into the observatory where a chronograph or time recorder is at work the astronomer wishes to record exactly when a certain phenomenon occurs so keeping his eyes to the telescope 
he has merely to press the button of the push which he holds in his hand and the chronograph downstairs will note the exact time to within 1000th of a second before going downstairs to see this chronograph which is so called from the greek words chronos time and grapho i write the visitor remarks that he is surprised to find that the dome requires to be moved round by hand to keep the open slot opposite the telescope having electricity at hand it would be a simple matter to apply a little motor to the wheels of the dome and the motor could either be under the direct control of the observer or it might at times be automatically controlled by the clock driving the telescope round coming down to the chronograph the visitor finds it a rather clumsy affair after the small and compact wind recording instruments there is a large cylinder carrying a sheet of paper wrapped around it the cylinder is slowly revolving by clockwork its speed being electrically controlled from the standard clock a pen moves slowly along the length of the cylinder its motion being exactly like that of the tympanum and stylus of a phonograph so that if the moving pen were left in contact with the revolving paper it would mark a spiral round and round the cylinder from one end to the other the pen is normally not in contact with the paper but at the end of each second of time the pen is made to strike against the paper making a small dot the pen is drawn sharply against the paper by an electromagnet which receives an impulse from the standard clock at the end of each second thus the chronograph paper shows a continuous series of equidistant dots on the paper the space between any two dots representing one second the push in the observer's hand away up in the dome is connected by wires to the electromagnet of the pen so that he can also send an impulse and make the pen strike the paper at any desired moment independent of the regular motion given to the pen by a clock thus a mark will be made in between the two dots representing a second by means of a scale the position of this dot may be measured and the time of the phenomenon be correctly found to the 1000th part of a second the astronomer has wires laid to his transit telescope and to any other parts of the observatory from which he may desire to record the exact time of various phenomena to obtain an absolutely accurate fraction of a second it is necessary to take the personal equation into account for some small fraction of time must elapse between the moment the observer sees a star cross the spider's web line in his transit telescope and the instant at which he presses the button of his push to make the signal to the chronograph some observers nerves and muscles will act quicker than will others and so the personal equation of any observer is determined by experiment one astronomical friend tells me that with long practice he is able to split a second up into 10 equal parts getting the beat of the standard clock in his ear he can observe correctly to the 10th part of a second so that the chronograph is only indispensable when a more exact fraction is required or when the observer is working at a point beyond earshot of his standard clock the chronograph has also a wide field of usefulness in timing the speed of projectiles etc on reaching another part of the observatory the visitor is somewhat surprised to learn that earthquakes occurring in all quarters of the world are made to leave their record by means of a small instrument in this room such instruments are called seismographs from the greek words seismos 
an earthquake and graph i write in order to prevent these being disturbed by any local earth vibrations such as caused by trains passing in the neighborhood etc a deep pit is dug about 20 feet down into the earth then a solid masonry pyre is built up and the seismograph rests on the top of this pyre in this way the instrument is really resting upon the solid earth some 20 feet down and is quite free from any surface disturbance there are two seismographs one for recording far distant earthquakes and the other only replying to local ones the latter instrument looks the much more imposing of the two in its large glass case forming a cube of about 6 feet in the center of the case is a large circular glass plate which has been smoked to give it a good black surface upon which a pen point may scratch a line there are three different pens resting on its surface at different parts each of these is connected to a different piece of metal so hung on a stand that it will move with the slightest change of level one weight is so arranged that it will move with any motion from north to south another records any motion from east to west while the third metal weight is hung on spiral springs so that any vertical or up and down motion will be recorded the glass plate upon which these pens are to move to and fro will of course require to revolve in order to take a record of the movements it would not be convenient to keep the plate continually revolving as local earthquakes are fortunately few and far between in this tranquil little island of ours and so it is necessary that the plate be set in motion on the occurrence of an earthquake it is here that electricity comes to the aid of the seismologist the clock for driving the glass plate is left fully wound up but a catch locking into one of the wheels prevents the clock from going so that the plate remains stationary this little catch may be drawn out of position by a small electromagnet so that anyone could start the clock by pressing the button of a bell push connected to a battery in circuit however it is not the intention of any person to wait on indefinitely to set the apparatus in motion at the required time this must be done automatically by the earthquake itself in place of the ordinary bell push in which one wire is pressed against another to complete the circuit there is a different arrangement here the one wire is fastened to a little piece of metal in which a tiny hole is drilled and the other wire hangs down freely in the center of this hole but does not touch the surrounding metal this wire is attached to the bob of a little pendulum which will move with the slightest change of level thus bringing the wire in contact with the metal attached to the other wire the first tremor of an approaching earthquake is sufficient to bring about this contact which is the equivalent of pressing the button of the push it is very important to be able to tell the exact hour at which any earthquake did occur and so another clock with an ordinary time dial is left wound up but held at 12 o'clock by a catch this catch is released by the same current that starts the driving clock and so the time clock begins to go at the first sign of an earthquake and as the clock sets off from 12 o'clock the observer coming to the apparatus later can tell exactly when the earthquake occurred this clock is placed close to the glass plate and is provided with a little pen which makes a small mark on the edge of the revolving plate at the end of each second so that the observer can tell the exact time of any particular movement indicated by the traced lines on the plate i have seen a very good record taken by one of these seismographs 
in Scotland of an earthquake occurring at a distance of 200 miles. The instrument which records earthquake happening at the other ends of the earth is not electrical and so I will merely mention it in passing. It consists of a very light aluminium boom delicately poised in a horizontal position so that it will swing from right to left by the slightest change of level of the pyre on which the apparatus stands. On the outer end of the boom, there is a thin aluminium plate or shutter having a longitudinal slit in it while the wooden case enclosing the apparatus has a lateral slit so arranged that the light of a lamp falling through these two slits forms a spot of light on the center of a paper ribbon which is slowly moving along by clockwork. This paper is photographic so that it takes an impression of the spot of light and if the boom carrying a shutter remains perfectly stationary, the light will mark a straight line up the center of the passing paper. Any movement of the boom to right or left will move the pencil of light to one side or the other and in this way the very smallest earth movements are recorded. I have seen excellent records taken in Scotland of the deplorable earthquakes that have occurred in Siberia and the more recent ones in India in each of which many thousands of lives were lost. I have been rather surprised to hear some men well learned in science suggesting that these seismographs would serve no useful purpose. But may we not hope that these records are the beginning of a line of research which may ultimately enable men to predict seismological disturbances and warn the inhabitants to flee from a threatened area. Many theories have been formed of the cause of earthquakes. None seem to appeal to one's mind as very satisfactory. But these seismographs will doubtless aid in arriving at an understanding of the true nature of these great natural disturbances in this planet of ours. Man has already acquired considerable knowledge in the prediction of storms, of wind and rain and yet one does not feel enough confidence in weather reports to decide empathetically whether to take an umbrella or a walking stick on one's daily wanderings. Of course, one difficulty is that there is a great variety of weather in different parts of the island at one time, but there is a factor which doubtless takes part in the changes of weather and which I do not think appeals forcibly enough to the meteorologist. There is a continual changing of the electrical condition of the atmosphere and this must have some connection with other atmospheric changes. Lord Kelvin invented an apparatus for recording these changes, but no very definite work seems to have been done with it. The apparatus requires a good deal of attention and I have seen one of these instruments go idle for months for lack of time to attain to it. There exists a very delicate instrument called a quadrant electrometer which measures the amount of charge of any electrified body. The principle is to compare the charge with a known standard charge and the standard is got from a battery of a hundred small primary cells. The atmospheric charge is obtained by placing a large copper bucket of water out of doors on an insulated stand. If water is allowed to continually drop from the bucket, the latter will become charged to the same potential as the surrounding atmosphere. An insulated wire leads the charge indoors to the electrometer where its effect is compared with that of the standard charge. The variation of effect gives movement to a small mirror which by means of a pencil of light traces its movements upon a photographic paper and in this way a rise and fall of electrical potential is recorded. Note, 
the courts observatory at pesle scotland contains practically all the apparatus described in this chapter this splendidly equipped observatory was presented to the town by some of the thread magnates whose name it bears end of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Romance of Modern Electricity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 23 Electricity and the Physician. As soon as primitive electrical machines had been constructed early in the 18th century, it became apparent that electricity had quite a startling effect upon the human body. At first the electric shock caused great alarm, as its magnitude had been grossly exaggerated by the few experimenters who had experienced it. One distinguished Dutch scientist declared he would not take a second shock for the crown of France, while on the other hand another experimenter announced that he was willing to die by electric shock in the interests of science. Another experimenter's wife, after receiving two shocks, was said to be rendered so weak that she could not walk, and though her husband had also suffered great convulsions, she tried a third shock, which was so violent as to cause bleeding of the nose. And so the exaggerated reports went on. As these early electrical machines became less rare, it soon became known that the shocks from them were really not so dreadful as they had been pictured. The idea of electricity being used for medical purposes seems to be very old indeed, as a writer living in the fourth century of the Christian era declares that a freedman of Tiberias was cured of the gout by a shock from a torpedo fish. I have no doubt the cure was as genuine as the many professed to have been obtained in recent times by wearing magnetic lockets, rings, or belts, or by using electric hairbrushes all of which must be placed under the category of quackery. There is no doubt that hypochondriacal invalids might receive, through their own imaginative powers, more nerve, and in this way it has been possible for quacks to display genuine testimonials. These early quackeries, no doubt, made people somewhat doubtful of the genuine attempts to use electricity as a curative power. It was found that the activity of muscles, nerves, and other tissues could be stimulated by electric currents, and some rash people at once declared that electricity was life itself. Even today, one sees in quack advertisements such statements as, quote, electricity is life, unquote. It was claimed by one experimenter that living germs had been actually formed in water by electricity. But when the matter was investigated, it was proved that the germs were associated with some impurities in the water, and when the experiment was repeated with distilled water, there was absolutely no result. Electricity is employed by the physician as an aid to diagnosis in cases of paralysis, etc., but its most important use lies in the art of healing. Until recently, one of its chief applications was the stimulating of muscles into action, by which they might be kept exercised and prevented from degenerating during a temporary breakdown of communications between the muscle and the central nervous system. With the recently acquired knowledge of the existence of invisible rays and ether waves of different kinds, there was opened up quite a new field of work. It was found that some waves destroyed the life of bacteria or retarded their growth, and in this connection may be mentioned the Finson light treatment. A Finson lamp may consist of an ordinary arc lamp, the rays from which are reflected to the diseased part, being passed through a lens of water on their way in order to obstruct the heat waves. The beneficial rays are not the ordinary light waves, but those beyond the visible spectrum, termed ultraviolet light. These ultraviolet rays are not only present in the arc light, they are plentiful in sunlight, but the atmosphere readily absorbs them to such an extent that the arc light is richer in these. We are all familiar with the dreaded disease tuberculosis, which when affecting certain of the internal organs, and in particular the lungs, we call consumption and which, when appearing externally, attacking the skin and underlying tissues, is known as lupus. We are all too familiar with its unpleasant appearance when it attacks the nose, mouth, or cheek of the patient, but it is not necessarily confined to the face. These tubercular diseases of the skin have long baffled the physician, 
although they have been shown to be due to specific organisms. But now the bacteria have succumbed to these searching rays. Footnote. While bacteria are termed organisms, it must be understood that they belong to the vegetable kingdom, just as fungi do. Some people seem to think of these microbes not only as having animal life, but as possessing a kind of intelligence or instinct by which they may make their way about from one place to another. End of footnote. Curiously enough, these same rays are most hurtful in cases of smallpox and aggravate the disease very considerably. In the case of lupus, these rays not only kill off the bacteria, but stimulate the tissue, and thus aid very materially in the patient's rapid recovery. The affected part has usually to be exposed to the rays very frequently for some months, and while a great number of cases can be pronounced complete cures, there are others that seem too far advanced to be overcome. The X-rays have been found to operate in a similar manner in cases of lupus, malignant ulcers, etc., and sometimes the two treatments are used alternately. In some cases of even 20 years standing, which had been treated by all other methods, including the surgeon's knife, only to return again, these searching rays have completely annihilated the disease. The results obtained are really marvelous, and more especially so as the majority of the cases coming for treatment are those for whom there seems no further hope of cure by other methods. In addition to the Finson light and X-ray methods, there is to be added the use of high-frequency currents, such as are obtained from large Wimshurst machines, or more recently by an arrangement of induction coils and Leiden jars. Sometimes one method is found to act better than another in particular cases, and a change of treatment is found with many patients beneficial. Again, one method is sometimes more easily applied than another, owing to the position of the diseased part but it has been established beyond doubt that each of these methods is curative. Electricity gives the surgeon a most convenient method of cauterizing by heating a fine platinum wire on passing a current of electricity through it, and it also provides him with tiny lamps by means of which the cavities of the body may be examined. Apart from the curative properties of electricity, the possibility of being able to examine the inside of a patient is of primary importance. A patient is brought in with a fractured arm or leg, and the surgeon can at once see what injury has been done to the bones. The spinal column and ribs can be examined, but the rays do more than distinguish the skeleton, although it is in connection with the bones that the Ronkin rays are at present of chief service. With properly adjusted tubes, the heart's action may be examined, and it gives one at first quite an eerie feeling to see a friend's heart at work. In some of our large hospitals, it is a daily occurrence to have to fish coins and other foreign bodies from the throats of children. The little patient is placed between the X-ray tube and a fluorescent screen, and in a moment the coin is detected. An exact description of its position is noted and handed to the surgeon, who can fish it out easily with his coin catcher. By means of the X-rays and a fluorescent screen, other organs of the body are quite distinguishable, such as the lungs and the liver and it is curious to watch the movement of the separating diaphragm at each long breath drawn by the lungs. If a needle or other foreign body be accidentally lodged in the flesh, it can at once be located and got out without unnecessary cutting. The other day a medical man showed me an X-ray photograph he had just taken of the arm of an old lady who had met with an accident. The photograph proved that no injury had been done to the bone, but it incidentally showed a needle embedded in the arm close to the wrist, and probably carried about unconsciously for a lifetime. As the lady was over seventy years of age, and as there was no likelihood of the needle troubling her now, the matter was not mentioned to her. A specialist finding a boy's throat giving him trouble discovered, by means of the x-rays, a halfpenny embedded in the throat tissue, the coin having evidently been there for some considerable time. It is difficult to estimate the great value of an X-ray apparatus on the battlefield for finding out at once where the bullets or fragments of shell have lodged without the painful and unsatisfactory probing formerly necessary. One can remember how even the best skill failed in the case of President Garfield of the United States, who was shot in 1881 by a disker. Had the existence of these X-rays been then known, there is little doubt that the President would not have had to depart this life at the age of fifty. It is impossible to tell not only how much suffering has been avoided, but how many lives have already been saved 
by the aid of Rolkin's discovery. The use of X-rays in taking photographs, or more particularly for curative purposes, should not be attempted except under experienced medical supervision, as too long exposure or the use of a defective tube may bring about serious burns, which in some cases have become permanent sores. Reports of such occurrences should not, however, deter any patient from submitting himself or herself to the rays under the guidance of a competent physician. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Romance of Modern Electricity This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2022. The Romance of Modern Electricity by Charles R. Gibson. Chapter 24 Electricity and Radium exaggerated notions of radium radium detected by electricity how radium was discovered why it cost so much how all bodies if sufficiently cold become phosphorescent radium and shadow graphs the physician and radium the atom slowly breaking up may we ever hope to transmute the baser metals into gold how we might realize what a million really is. How very minute quantities of radium are traced. Is the old problem of perpetual motion at last solved? Radium is continually producing electricity. How radium remains at a higher temperature than its surroundings. Is all matter radioactive? When the wonderful properties of that magic worker, radium, were made known to the world, its capabilities soon became greatly exaggerated and distorted in the mind of the general public. Its rays were to do far greater wonders in the hands of the physician than those dealt with in the last chapter, and it was claimed that even cancer would flee on exposure to the radium rays. Some predicted that radium would be in the near future a great source of motive power and of heat, enabling us to dispense with the clumsier methods of the present time. The announcement of the properties of radium did not come as such a surprise to those interested in science, for other radioactive bodies were already well known, although not nearly so active. Yet, even among scientists, there were those who feared that the properties exhibited by radium would upset some long-established theories, such as the conservation of energy. It did not take long, however, for the first excitement to subside. In order to justify the coupling of radium and electricity together in the title of this chapter, I may remark at the outset that, but for electricity, it is doubtful if the presence of radium could ever have been detected, as will be explained later, and before the close of the chapter there will be shown a very intimate connection between radium and electricity. It is interesting to trace how radium came to be discovered. For a very long time it had been known that certain substances, such as zinc sulphide, would phosphoresce in the dark for some considerable time after being exposed to light and the general public have been long familiar with luminous paints as used on matchboxes, etc. Uranium salts were supposed to belong to the same category, but shortly after Röntgen had discovered that his X-rays could affect a photographic plate, Professor Becquerel of Paris found that uranium emitted rays in the same way. And I remember seeing one of the earliest shadow graphs produced by exposure to uranium about 1896. These rays were named Becquerel rays after the discoverer. It was soon found that uranium did not require to be previously exposed to light in order to give out these rays, but continued to be incessantly radioactive. A little later, Sir William Crookes of London found that the radioactivity was not really due so much to the uranium itself as to some impurity in the salts. It was then that Madame Curie, wife of Professor Curie of Paris, herself a distinguished chemist, 
set about a long series of chemical experiments to try and locate the most radioactive element. Her husband soon joined her in the painstaking search, and they found that the tailings or residue of the ore from which uranium had been extracted proved to be more radioactive than the uranium itself. They then set about separating one constituent after another by chemical processes, evaporation, crystallization, precipitation, etc., and they ultimately found three distinct elements showing radioactivity. These the Curies named radium, polonium, and actinium, each of which is highly radioactive, but while polonium appears to be the most active, radium occurs in the greatest quantity. The metal radium has never been separated, but is found in combination with chlorine as radium chloride, or with bromine as radium bromide. The total amount of these radioactive bodies found in pitch blend, from which they are extracted, is, according to Professor J. J. Thompson, less than the gold held in solution in seawater. As it would be necessary to treat thousands of tons of pitch blend to obtain one pound of radium, it will be readily understood wherein the great cost of radium occurs. Of course, the quantities even of the compounds that have been extracted are exceedingly small, and indeed we cannot hope that there will ever be any great accumulation of radium, as it is only matter in a transitory state, probably being a disintegrated product of uranium, and during its own existence being itself busy breaking up into other forms of matter. Of course it takes a very long time to disappear, but its production is probably very much slower. Radium chloride looks very much like ordinary table salt, with a slightly yellowish color. One of its most striking properties is the power of some of its rays to cause certain chemically prepared screens to fluoresce, just as a Röntgen ray apparatus does, but on a much smaller scale. Radium chloride and bromide form crystals which are self-luminous in the dark, but the scintillations seen in a Crookes spin telescope are due to the incessant bombardment of the invisible rays against the small fluorescent screen. It may incidentally be remarked here that the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence is that the former is only present as long as the exciting rays are falling upon the crystals, whereas a phosphorescent body emits light for some considerable time after exposure. Professor Dewar maintains that all bodies would become phosphorescent if their temperature was lowered sufficiently, and he has produced phosphorescence in eggshells, ivory, feathers, and paper, when cooled down to about 200 degrees below zero, Fahrenheit scale, by means of liquid air, the temperature of which is another hundred degrees lower still. When these bodies are at such a low temperature and exposed to light, they seem to have the property of absorbing energy and then giving off light at higher temperatures. Another property of radium is its effect upon a photographic plate, by which shadowgraphs or radiographs may be produced, but as these had already been produced by X-rays, this property did not cause so much wonderment. The next property of interest to the public is the physiological effects of some of the radium rays, which cause a sore on any part of the body kept for long in proximity to even the minute specimens at present existing, and these effects are not immediately apparent, but develop some days after exposure. Great hopes were at first entertained that in the medical world radium would prove of great value, but it seems doubtful if there is any different effect from that already obtainable from electrical apparatus. When good specimens are more easily obtained, it may be found that a small tube of radium could get at some internally diseased parts to which at present it is found impossible to send the electrical rays, but it is necessary to use great caution in applying radium rays to the human body. There are three distinctly different kinds of rays emitted by radium, and for convenience these have been distinguished by the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma. The alpha and beta rays are exceedingly fine particles of disintegrated matter, 
but the gamma rays are either vibrations very similar to if not identical with the well-known röntgen rays which we artificially produce by electrical means the material radiations carry with them charges of electricity and are affected by a neighboring magnet in addition to these radiations it was discovered that radium gave off a radioactive gas which is not common to all radioactive bodies this gas has been collected vaporized and even liquefied by the low temperature of liquid air if a long glass tube be coated with a chemical substance which will become luminous in the presence of radioactive bodies the passage of this gas or radium emanation may be followed as it is sent along the tube it is supposed that these emanations are merely a few of the radium atoms breaking up into other forms of matter and even then these resulting atoms are not stable but also disintegrate and helium gas is found to be one resultant but as any other resulting atoms do not show signs of radioactivity it has been found impossible to follow them this disintegration of atoms is by far the most interesting point in connection with radium by chemical process or as we shall see by electrolysis we can break up a molecule of water into two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen but we can go no further and for more than a century the doctrine of dalton that the atom is indivisible or as clark maxwell has said that the atoms are the foundation stones of the universe has remained our creed here however in radium and other similar bodies the atom itself is breaking up in the course of nature the radium atom as already explained is transformed by nature into an entirely different element named helium gas and so the question arises may we not yet hope some day to find a means of transmuting the baser metals into precious gold at present we can neither produce or control this breaking up of the atom and as mr soddy remarked recently we may never hope to be able to transmute silver into gold but at some far distant date if this disintegration can be produced it might be found possible to transform gold into silver which is of lower atomic weight even if we could all turn our coppers into golden sovereigns our fortunes would not long be made it is impossible to form any adequate conception of the size of an atom but it is of interest to gain some mental comparison with the microscope we see tiny objects which make no impression whatever upon the unaided vision and with a powerful microscope minute objects measuring one fifty thousandth part of an inch are made visible in this statement we have already got far beyond the range of any definite comparison and yet the very smallest particle of matter that can be seen by the most powerful microscope contains some eighteen to twenty millions of atoms and again every one of this multitude comprises at least a thousand fragments or as professor j j thompson terms them corpuscle who can form any adequate conception of the size of a corpuscle how many million times a million must there be in a tiny speck of water it is very difficult even to form a clear mental picture of what one million means and i would add my humble endorsement to the suggestion made by dr a k wallace in man's place in the universe that every town should have a public room set aside with one million dots clearly shown upon its walls so that the young mind might form some clearer conception of the true magnitude of a million to think of a million as the numeral one with six ciphers appended means nothing and while we may picture a million as a thousand thousands or as a hundred groups of ten thousand and so on i do not doubt that after becoming accustomed to a visual impression of one million dots at one time we could form a much clearer estimate of the magnitude of such a number the wily politician when seeking to impress upon his constituents the money being squandered by the government of the day would doubtless ask them to visit the million room and then imagine each dot to be a golden sovereign and having formed that picture to multiply it by so many hundreds of duplicate rooms and so on i have wondered somewhat from the title of this chapter 
but i think it of importance that we should not be content to pass over any reference to millions without some attempt at a mental picture of their vastness i believe it has been owing to a failure of this kind that people claimed for radium the destruction of the theory of the conservation of energy they said here we have radium giving out energy and without any loss to itself if however one tries to picture this energy as being due to the disintegration of one atom per second in a million billions of atoms while some three hundred millions of these atoms might lie together in a row inside one inch then who can hope to live long enough to observe any perceptible loss in its gross bulk or weight we need not fear therefore that the advent of radium is going to upset all our learning and in this connection i think the words of sir oliver lodge of great interest a bare fact is nothing or little 